This is the D6 Generation with your hosts, Craig Gallant. Oh, if you're getting any compensation, it's not charity. Russ Wakelin. You put me on a boat with freaking dragons attacking me and whatnot? Now nah, we're talking. And Eric Johns in the third chair. I'm not weird. I just dress that way. With contribution from Total Fangirl. Vampires do not sparkle. And our loyal listeners. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Welcome to another edition of Rapid Fire, the roundtable discussion of all things gaming, coming out to the speed of a newly cast sprue of high polymer plastic kicked out of its brand new aluminum mold. Ooh. Today's edition is brought to you by Roos. The only way to escape a murder charge is to pin it on someone else first. Quick, what's your alibi? Roos, coming soon to Kickstarter.com. I'm Geekly McNerdigan, your host today. As always, our panelists are Russ Black Pearl Wakeland Ooh. and Eric Silver Onk Johns, stalwart frontman and creative genius on staff at Weird Miniatures. Let's begin. Issue number one. A plastic material is any of a wide range of synthetic or semi-synthetic organic solids that are moldable. Plastics are typically organic polymers of high molecular mass, but they often contain other substances. They are usually synthetic, most commonly derived from petrochemicals, but many are partially natural. Question. Most plastics are produced from petrochemicals, motivated by the finiteness of petrochemical reserves and the possibility of global warming. Plastic companies have been trying to develop plastics from what new materials? Integrative Russ. Dinosaur toenails. Elastic Eric. Uh, recycled old miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, although both witty, they are also both wrong. In an attempt to move away from the Petrochem products of common plastic today, companies have taken a researching bioplastics made substantially from renewable plant materials such as cellulose and starch. It's not exciting, but it's right. Issue number two. Clearly all of the best right as incorrect uh, <laughs> for that question. Um, <laughs> issue number two. Clearly all of the best figure painters in the world paint with only a single brush. The Windsor and Newton brush brush brush. <laughs> with a retail price of over $30, you know this is going to be an amazing brush even before you see your first specimen. But when you're dropping $30 for a single brush, even if it's the only brush you'll ever need, you'd like to know where it's coming from. Question. The company of Windsor and Newton was founded in 1832 by William Windsor and Henry Newton, originally located at Henry Newton's home in what city? Carl Raul Ross. Oh, uh, Paraguay. Alfred E. That is a country, not a city. <laughs> Alfred E. Eric. I'm going to go with Singapore for all the Chinese hair. Ah, well, that's another interesting guess, and both again wrong. 38 Rathbone Place, London, of course. Oh. This was then uh, an artist's quarter in which a number of eminent painters, including Constable Ed Studios and other color men, were esta already established. Issue number three. Since his first appearance in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones has become a worldwide star and remains one of cinema's most revered movie characters. In 2003, he was ranked as the second greatest movie hero of all time by the American Film Institute. He was also also named the sixth greatest movie character by Empire Magazine. Entertainment Weekly ranked Indy second on their list of the all-time coolest heroes in pop culture. Premier Magazine also placed Indy at number seven on their list of the 100 greatest movie characters of all time. Question. We all know him and love him, but do any of us know his full name? Rene Bellac Russ. Uh, Henry Jones Jr. I don't know his middle name, though. Uh, Elsa Schneider Eric. Uh, obviously Han Solo. <laughs> nice. Ah, uh, points for creativity and quick thought, but unfortunately, <laughs> wrong! And Russ, we'd give you partial credit, but in this show, there is no partial credit, so you are wrong also. Dr. Henry Walton, oh. Indiana Jones Jr. would have been acceptable. Issue number four, from Angry Birds to Minecraft... Uh, pocket edition from draw something to words with friends the gaming universe available on our smartphones is wider than ever and promises to continue to widen as more and more new games are released now no matter where our lives take us we can find something to distract us from what's around us question these games do not only provide hours of fun for gamers some of them strike gaming gold and make lots of money for their makers as well name any one of the top five money makers in the iStore as of 2010 Wreck the Halls, Wakeland. Well, you didn't exempt Angry Birds because that's a softball. 2010. Wreck the Halls, Wakeland. I'm going Angry Birds, though. Year of the Dragon Johns. How about Rage of Bahamut? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, both are wrong. 
wrong. As of 2010, Crash Bandicoot Nitro Car 3D was number one. Bejeweled 2 was number two. <laughs> Koi Pond was number what? three. Enigmo number four. And of course, the ever prevalent iBeer came in as the fifth uh, app. <laughs> really? Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for listening and good night. This episode of the D6 Generation is brought to you by Lone Wolf Development. Take your game to the next level. And by ArmorCast, your home for resin, battlefield scenery, and metal cinematic effects. ArmorCast.com And by Geek Nation Tours. Rise up and join the Geek Nation touring the world at GeekNationTours.com and the war store, bringing the war to your door since 1999, and that is for a decade or more. And by Audible. Try the service, get a free book, and support the show. All by visiting audibletrial.com slash d6g. And by gamesalute.com. Check out gaming news or find out what the new hotness is on Springboard, gamesalute.com. Hello! Hello! Hello. Hello, and welcome to episode 112 of the D6 Generation. That just seems very substantial. I'm Russ Wakeland. I'm Craig Gallant. And I'm Eric Jones. Hello, Eric, and welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. And as you may know, of course, Eric thanks. Johns is the main man behind Weird Miniatures, of course, or one of the main men. Yes, we don't want to upset one of, Nathan. One of, one of the man. dynamic duo, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, He's Eric, a little how- upset already, so. Uh-oh. <laughs> Does he want to come on? Can you call him? <laughs> right, call him up. <laughs> so he's a shy. Uh, well, no. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so any, anyway, so how are things going down at Weird Miniatures? Not bad. We're uh, busy, busy, busy. Excellent. Well, excellent. We, how we, did Gen Con go for you guys? It's all that busy is kind of an extension thereof. Ah, nice. indeed, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Yeah, I guess post Gen Con, you must be shipping a lot of stuff still. Um, well, Eric was kind enough to join us today. We really appreciate it. We're going to talk a lot about uh, uh, all kinds of fun things. And first of all, we're going to talk about plastics and yes. how they get made. And, and you know, as, as many of you now know, Weird, of course, just switched over to plastics. So we thought, who better than the man who just went through the entire process of figuring out how to do it all? That's uh, right. Eric Johns and the rest of the crew over there. So, um, so Eric, thanks for joining us on that. And then also we're going to talk sure. about uh, digital diversions. What kind of. Um, what do we do when we're got a little time to kill? And what are our favorite games and things on on our i iPhones or mm-hmm. Android phones? And what are the little portable devices we have lying about? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm. Cool. But first, before we get to all that, we should talk about. Um, oh, you know, we haven't had a contest in a while, Craig. I think it's time for another one. That's very true. Now it's curious because uh, when Eric came up to uh, record the last chapter at uh, Dunkin' Donuts, he brought with him a big box of beautiful, weird plastic goodness. He did. I've got it right in front of me here, and I have to say, we've got some cool stuff here. First of all, um, let's see. We've got, uh, ooh, this is cool. Lazarus, the new oh, plastic. Oh, that is an awesome mini. Oh, he looks awesome. Now, and by it's... mini, I mean huge. Right. Small disclaimer, Lazarus actually comes with a little bit of metal. There's a screw which actually holds them together in the oh, middle. Oh, so does he and, pivot? Yeah, that's and, abnormal. That is and abnormal. he can pivot on his waist, can he not? He can. Yeah. Pretty much all his joints pivot. He oh, can, nice. You can walk him around like an action figure. So the fully articulated Lazarus model, that's in there. Wow. And of course, now, uh, we also got Willie here. Willie the Demolitionist. Oh, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Who I think you could write a story about just from looking at the front of the picture, really. He's, he's pretty awesome. Now, yeah. Also, now this is particularly interesting Russ, to Russ, me where? because this, these, I just battled these guys last night. We got the entire Dark Debts box from you guys, ah. Eric. Now, this is that whole new uh, plastic uh, crew, right? Uh, Jacob Lynch and the Hungering Darkness and uh, all the little illuminated folk, right? Yes, yeah, creepy, creepy. These are awesome. I, I literally just played against these guys last night, and they are fantastic looking models. All plastic, look great. Details They're are amazing. They're all mutating and getting drained oh, of yeah. their life essence and all kinds of cool stuff. They didn't need it. Yeah, they're like... It, that's true. They clearly weren't using it. It's kind of funky. <laughs> exactly. It's it's very weird, if you will, because it, it, they it, are... It is very weird. They are chaos-like, but instead of darkness, they're filled with light. Uh, see how they did that? It's pretty neat. Now, also... I had to ask. You keep going away. I have to go pull these out of the box. Now these things I had it's to bad ask. Bad radio, man. I had to ask Eric about these. These are um, bases, 
and they are translucent bases in a variety of colors. We've got like one, two, three, four, five blisters of these Ooh, things. That's the whole run. They're like teal. There's like a, a, a yellow, a purple, a red. And um, later in the show, I actually asked Eric how you would use these things. And, I, and he, Eric was kind of to give away a little tip as to how they're going to work. And these are really cool looking things. Really make, make, make your uh, crew look very unique. And then finally, now Eric, did you know you guys sent us this too? Uh, we got a box of the new Puppet Wars plastics. Oh, wow. Yeah. Those, those, are, those, those are like under lock and key. Huh? I don't know, but they showed up in the box. So I have a conversation with a few people <laughs> in our warehouse. So if you want those before anybody else has them, you got to win this contest. Right? Now, uh, Craig, what do you think the best way to, to sort of do this contest would be? What, what well, do you, what I mean, do? that is an awful lot of really cool stuff, some of which you can't get anywhere else. Right. So uh, I'm thinking it's going to have to be a little bit demanding. Oh, yeah. You got to think this through. This is not yeah, your yeah. – this isn't a haiku gonna, this time, folks. Sorry. No, no. We're going to need you to be a little more creative. And what I'm thinking is uh, actually from our Facebook page, we got a good – recommendation mm -hmm. and that was do a quick radio spot for weird miniatures mm -hmm. or malifo the game specifically and we're talking pithy keep yeah. it short keep it smart <laughs> yeah. keep it fun right 30 seconds or or less but keep in mind that you need to have some meat to it to really be considered right and you know get as crazy as you want if you want to do it in the style of willie here the demolitionist doing a radio ad or or anything about the products, or Jamalifo in general, or weird miniatures, That's whatever you want to do. Uh, take a to, character to, to to make this fun and exciting and interesting, and uh, we'll listen to all the entries, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll pick one, and, and maybe I don't know, Eric, if you have time to, to listen to a couple too, maybe you can help us judge, and we can have certainly. a certainly we can you guys can and we can help us pick out the the favorite one, and who knows, uh, Eric, maybe you guys will end up with actual radio spot you can use. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, great. So, and again, Craig, where should they send all their contest entries to? Well, uh, well, class, as we always say, only entries that are sent to contest at the d6generation.com will be mm -hmm. considered. That is true. And as we all are contest, they run for two episodes. So that gives yep. you about four weeks. So start thinking of your, of your things now and uh, keep an eye out for episode. And I'll tell you what I tell my students. If you wait till the last minute, you will not be doing your best work. Right. So you've got four weeks. Plan it out ahead of time. I never did as a student, but I don't tell them that part. Right. Plan it out ahead of time. Right. Waste not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So we look forward to seeing those. Good luck to everyone. And this is really a cool prize pack. You will not be disappointed with all these cool plastics. Uh, okay. Oh, also, we have a couple of announcements. First of all, we haven't talked about it yet this year, and we are very negligent in not doing so. Extra Life is drawing near, is it not? Uh, it is indeed. Now, uh, as many of you may know, Extra Life is, of course, that great... Uh, gaming charity event that happens every fall in October, uh, and folks do a gaming marathon. Uh, you can play video games, you can play board games, miniature games, whatever kind of gaming you want to play um, in October, and um, it's kind of like you do pledges for walkathons. It's a gameathon, and you get people to pledge, and all the money goes to your favorite children's hospital. Yeah. Right. We happen to choose Boston Children's Hospital Boston here. Boston Children's yep. Hospital. But, we all uh, you, have very personal connections with it. We do. But you can pick any of your local hospitals uh, that, that help the children. And it's great. It's part of the Children's Miracle Network of Hospitals. Uh, it's a fantastic charity. And Craig and I are both participating. Yep. Um, and if you'd like to participate, please head on over to extralife.org and sign up. If you don't have the time or you don't feel like you can, come on over and pledge to us. What we'll do is uh, you pledge for how many hours you think we're going we're gonna to game for. Uh, which is basically 24. Um, and, um, and that's your donation to the charity. We really appreciate it. It'd be great. Yep. And uh, as always, I'm sure we'll have some rewards set up mm -hmm. to give away. Uh, and I just finished uh, f um, finalizing my the, a little agreement with Neil from, um, from Spartan Games again. So we're going to do the same thing as last year where the person who donates the most to me, because it's all about me, yes, really, and self-aggrandizement. <laughs> this has nothing to do with the charity no. in my head. Right. Uh, the f person who don not, not, ooh, donates the most to me, or through me to the charity, I should say, uh, will work with me to come up with an idea, and I will write a short story featuring you in any of the Spartan Games universes. And uh, you will also receive you'll, – you'll send us a picture and the Spartan artist is actually going to d do a full portrait of you as the character that, uh, that we come up with for that short story. And that short story will appear on their website as a feature of the, uh, of the Spartan Games web presence for that week. And this year, I think what I'm also going to – like last year – those of you who remember, I actually wrote a short story that featured every single person that donated 
to me, which was over 40 people. Uh, and because of them and their generosity and their greed, because they wanted to be, uh, you know, uh, in that story, <laughs> I actually ended up 17th in the entire world for Extra Life, which nice. was awesome. That's awesome. I briefly broke the top 10, and then a bunch of people must have gotten uh, donations after the uh, the day, and I got knocked back down to 17. Cheers. So the goal here is to break number 10, break into the top 10, and stay there. There you go. So. You will get I, – I will – again, I'm going to try to get everybody in, but I'm going to do it this way. If you give me $1 or $5, you'll get in, but you may be a rat or, you know, you may be like a space herpy. I don't know. <laughs> space and herpy. Uh, the more you give, even if you don't get that top spot, the more prominent your character will be. So be generous. This is for an awesome cause. And hopefully uh, the story will uh, will rock. Last year was a really cool pirate story. Uh, so you can you can we can do almost anything within any of those universes over at Spartan. So uh, let's get this going. There you go. So Eric for the children for only a dollar, Eric, you too mm-hmm. could be a space herpy. That's true. There, there you have. I, it. <laughs> well, I think a space herpy is going to cost <laughs> take at least like five. Okay, five bucks for the space. I herpy. mean, please, Got space it. herpy. That's like a classic. So check it out. We'll have links to both of our donor pages and all that other good stuff uh, uh, on the D sixty website uh, by the time you hear this. So check yep. that out. Yep. Super excited. Now, Eric, also, in addition to coming on the show, Eric was also kind enough to join us for the Lost Chapters. Eric, do you remember what we discussed in the Lost Chapters here recently? Um, of course. Do you want to hold me? <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. There you go. So Eric does remember. Well, <laughs> Eric does remember. Okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so we discussed advanced painting tips, right? Eric gave yeah. us some insight into uh, his painting. He gives a lot of insight. There I'm some actually good stuff. in the middle of a project that I'm following his advice on right now. I know, me too. I've just started Talk it. about it later in uh, yeah, achievements. Very excited about that. So um, you want to check out the Lost Chapters, you can do so by going to the d6generation.com and clicking on the little stack of books on the right-hand side there. Uh, and if you use our free iOS or Android app, you can get all of our stuff really easily that way as well. We really appreciate right. those who support us. And I do speak more in the last chapters than I have so far. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully more. Well, speaking of speaking, let's get on to achievements and gaming. So, Craig, what is it time now for? Well, you just said it's time for achievements in gaming. It is indeed a time for achievements in gaming. And uh, let's see. Achievements in gaming is brought to us this week by Rift Walkers, Spark Collars, and Whiz Bangers, Light Bringers, Tail Spinners, and Storm Chasers Story Realms. Pledge now at kickstarter.com. There you go. Thank you, Story Realms, for that. Story Realms. So, Eric, why don't we do guests first since you've been so quiet so long? What <laughs> have you been playing lately? It's actually, um, The Office has been swept by two games, actually. One of them, brand new, just a few months old, and another uh, nine or ten years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and both, for, for various reasons. But uh, it's actually an app game, the one we've been playing lately, and it's called Blood Brothers. Uh, and that's the like quick, if you want to pull your phone out and kill five minutes waiting for the bus, mm-hmm. um, you can go in and, and, and slay some little guys and, and, and like get your familiars and level them up and Ooh. show off your familiars to everyone else in the office and say, ha ha, mine are better than yours. That's PvP. I destroyed you. <laughs> nice. Um, which, which is, you know. It's it's the best thing for a boss to do. Be like, not not only did <laughs> second only to uh, having them owe you money from a poker game. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then the other one is actually Kingdom of Loathing. Um, mm. if, if you remember that one, which has been around for over ten years, I believe, um, and it's a web based game, yeah. and it is collecting meat and destroying yetis and <laughs> other various uh, very cleverly drawn stick figures. Dude, you had me at meat. That sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> so, so really, I mean, if you if you look at our office, um, we're pretty much always playing those, nice. getting very little work done. Nice. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, so two random titles for you. Great, great. So that's yeah. that's great. Um, now, have you played any? Um, do you guys play any quick uh, card games or anything between games or anything? Well, obviously, other than other than Evil Baby Orphanage, of course. <laughs> we we actually we actually. I had to tell people to leave because they were playing Evil Baby Orphanage this afternoon. I was like, I got to go do this interview, so you guys got to leave. Like, <laughs> get out, go but, home. But, and I'm like, no, you're done. Um, however, I have to get rid of Caligula. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had Brutus chasing Caesar around. It's like, that doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it's brilliant. Oh, it's um, hilarious. But yeah, we've been playing. Uh, uh, a big one's been Yomi lately. Oh, yeah. Around okay. the office. Yep. Um, which uh, we actually it's just been kind of going crazy around here. 
Uh, and we just, uh, what, it's, it's easy. The World of Warcraft game. A lot of people have been uh, just because we've been we've been really kind of getting into this idea of cooperative gaming. Yeah. Um, so so uh, so those two card games have been sort of having a lot of play lately around our place. Oh, very cool. Nice well, achievement for that. Very good. Uh, Craig, how about you? What have you been playing? Yeah. What have I been playing? Uh, most of my gaming be, uh, during the play, I don't get to game a lot, but luckily there's been a little change in schedule, so I can get uh, to gaming night. Um, for a little bit, and lately what we've been doing is a 40K campaign because uh, that's what my friends wanted to play, and that's what I thought would get them all to play at the same place at the same time. Has it worked? Uh, <laughs> that particular goal has only met with limited success. <laughs> Uh, apparently, stating your clear objectives is not often enough. Um, but yeah, so I've been having a blast, and most of the folks have been having a really good time, I think. Um, 40K 6th Edition is everything that we talked about when we reviewed it. It's very cinematic, and it's very random. And uh, I have been enjoying it a lot. A lot of the, a couple of the things that I really am enjoying now that I've played a few more games is uh, snap firing and mm -hmm. the way that rapid fire weapons have changed so that you no longer – I've always hated the way rapid fire weapons were used so you had to stay still mm -hmm. to get the, benef the real benefit of your gun. Right. So the whole game seemed to be constantly static, and and even if you had hand to hand armies, you didn't want to move because you if you move, you gave up all this uh, ability. So just the mere fact that you can move and still shoot your gun is uh, is huge. And I can't tell you, I I'm running my guard, mm -hmm. the forty uh, second Armageddon Regiment Hell, Hell's Reach Highlanders right again, nice. which is awesome because they haven't really seen any play regularly in almost ten years. And uh, I'm loving little three team, uh, I mean, uh, heavy weapon teams with three missile launchers mm -hmm. running around the board, snap firing, hitting on sixes. Nice. Especially when that snap fire on a six hits a, uh, a Tau skimmer and knocks it out of the sky on a six, nice. which is wildly improbable. <laughs> so uh, we've been doing that a lot. The campaign is a campaign that I came up with on my own that's based... Uh, sort of as a as a mix of the uh, Mighty Empires mm -hmm. and Planetary Empires campaign engines from GW, but um, not really. They've mutated beyond either of the. I mean, the, well, actually, they're not even close to the Planetary Empires one, which is awful. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, everybody's having a lot of fun. There's a little randomness to it. There usually you have to choose events in Mighty uh, Empires, and you like the low guy gets to choose a, the best one, and whatever happens. And there are all kinds of neat little effects in the in each game, each campaign round. But this crowd, Joel Carlson in particular, mm -hmm. wanted it to be super random. So we're rolling randomly on the on the events table, which is nice. kind of crazy. <laughs> so uh, it's been a lot of fun. I actually tweeted my first picture. Oh wow! Of achievement the gaming for that. thing. Wow! Wow! Yeah, I tweeted my a picture of the Hell's Reach Highlanders set up to fight Dave's Tau. Nice. Welcome to 2012. Um, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank no you. I, I I'm wanting to reach through this and <laughs> slap you, but you know whatever. <laughs> And uh, and and I that was a win. That was a very close game. Lots of fun. And then I played Rich Sinatra's Necrons, and I made one super super silly. And there's all kinds of cool stuff that never would have happened in Fifth Edition or any time before. Like when you're rolling your uh, your warlord's ability, and usually they're useless. But I got the one that the warlord and a unit you attach him to get to outflank. And yep, nice. he's he was already attached to a whole infantry platoon. So yeah. an entire guard inf infantry platoon came on on a flank. Wow. And it was craziness. And I if I had made if I had and you still lost that game. huh? How, how did that go? Oh, I, it was brutal because <laughs> uh, I I went after the wrong flank mm -hmm. and I let I went after the wrong model. He had a, one of those barges that the Lord stands in. Mm hmm. And I was like, holy crap, and we're playing a very small point value game, and there's very, very, very rigid rules, and one of them is you can't have very strong um, vehicles, and another one is you can't have um, very powerful heroes, so it's very much about the troops. But if you get a lot of troops in your army, you can break one rule. And one thing, and this was written back in third or uh, maybe fourth edition. I wrote this, yeah. and so I haven't taken into account any of the new stuff. So the Necrons currently, and there's two of them in the campaign, mm -hmm. are floating around. They took enough troops so they can break one rule. They so they've got a lord. So here I am with a little Imperial Guard lieutenant, and they've got a Necron lord. 
And on top of that, there's a piece of war gear they have that gives their vehicle plus two armor to the front and sides until you can breach it for the first time. So they're flying around with an armor 13 skimmer. So I was like, ah, and and it had the Lord in it. So I was terrified and I was shooting everything at it and I couldn't break it. And come to find out, it could do almost no damage. But I didn't know that until (laughs) towards the end of the game when it wasn't doing any damage. And I had basically spent two rounds trying to do it, kill it while... You know, those, you you know, you remember guard, Russ, you get those Necron warriors on you and they can erase a squad a turn if you're in the open, which I was, which I was. So I got wasted uh, because I did that in the wrong thing. But I'm having an absolute blast. I really enjoy the game and I'm I'm having fun with uh, with my friends. Good. So that's what I've been playing. Oh, that's not all I've been playing because I tweeted some more today. Oh, no. Uh, oh, yes. I've been playing a lot of timeline with my classes, which yeah. I thought I could do, and I really could with a couple tweaks to the way the game works. I've been playing it with classes up to 20 people, and they love it. Well, uh, the, the, the upper-level cl- kids love it, and the freshmen or lower-level kids are like, why do we care when uh, writing was invented? <laughs> and I'm like, that's not the point. It was when it was invented <laughs> as opposed to clay tablets. Come on. It's so awesome. And uh, so so a lot of the kids have been in, ex- enjoying that. I played Werewolf a lot today because we've been working really hard on the set. So to reward them, we played Werewolf. And this was the week that we play our gladiatorial naval combat game. Yeah. And we finished that up today, and it was awesome. It ended up – and there's no such thing as sides or anything. It's every man for himself unless you set up an alliance on your own. Mm. And for the first time, I was accepted into an alliance, Russ. It was That's great. That's nice. You Usually the like kids you. just kill me right off the bat. Right, kill the teacher. Like, right. Wait a minute. We can shoot the teacher? Okay. Well, we're going to do that. So this ended up being like a north <laughs> versus south ally situation, and it was, uh, it was a great, great game. And I tweeted a picture of – one of the alliances moving across the room, and then I nice. tweeted a picture of the other alliance moving across the room, so you can see like the different boats that all my students made, and nice. uh, so Very it was cool. a blast. Had a had a really good time. Let's go check that out. So yeah. All right. So well, I went to my friendly professional gaming store, which of course is Myriad oh, Games. What's that? I know, right? Myriad Games up here in Manchester, and they do a great job there on behalf of friendly professional gaming stores everywhere. They help us out with the show. And, Absolutely. Uh, be sure to check out all the latest stuff. And if you're, if you're thinking about Extra Life, come on up to Myriad Games for that as well because they have a great – they're open 24 hours for Extra Life weekend. They have all kinds of prizes and fun stuff going on. So and although Russ won't well. be there, I will. Yeah, I have a family vacation. But I'll be on the makeup weekend. I'll be doing my Russ, Extra Life Russ has to go to Hawaii. It's right. so unfair. Oh, somebody has to. Yeah, oh, um, pumpkin. Yeah, I got, you know, I got to keep their tourism going down there. That's true. That's true. Um, but I went to there. Guess what I played just oh. yesterday, Eric? Um, I can't. Malifo. <laughs> no way. I did indeed. And in fact, I played against the very, I already mentioned earlier in the show, I played against um, the Dark Deaths crew here. I played against Jacob Lynch and everybody comes in a plastic box, our friend Adam. And a shout out to Adam. Adam works very, very hard to yes. keep the Malifo League going. He is like the biggest Malifo fanboy. Um, and he's fantastic at it. And he had, he had all these guys uh, built, had them all primed. He had the uh, Hungering Darkness all painted purple. He looked great. And... Um, I had a great moment, Eric. It was. I apologize. Oh, no. I have a two-year-old. No problem. Hello, <laughs> there. just came to say hi. She wanted to talk about her games. Nice. <laughs> her games is, include includes includes pulling cats' tails. Nice. And <laughs> playing with this little uh, party toy she found. <laughs> nice. Okay, go on. A party toy. <laughs> um, no, I was playing against him, and I had a great moment. So I'm running Perdita and a bunch of uh, death marshals. Really, pretty much my war band, uh, and. Um, mm-hmm. I had that moment where I, sh- I was doing bullet bending. I shot Jacob. It was near the end game and I had saved the red joker. Right. So I had everything said I hit him and I hit him without a negative flip. So I was able to, um, cheat the, cheat the damage. And I cheated with a red joker. He got another hit him. I'm hitting him with 12 damage. I'm like, I have you now. He does this. He has that ability where he can shrug off into a healing thing and he shrugs it. And the only way he can survive is if he flips a red joker he flips the red ace, which for Jacob is a red joker. He flips it right off the top of the deck. It's total luck. He gets it. He shrugs it off. We're like cheering. Everybody's like, this is amazing. But Perdita always keeps a second rounder gun and just shot him dead with a second <laughs> round. It was much less exciting. The second round did like four damage when he needed to kill him. But it was, it, was a, it was a really cool moment. It was a fantastic game. And those guys, those illuminate. He's like, so things are going to get brightness on them, and it's going to be bad. I'm like, well, that's not too big deal. And as they're going, I'm like, i got to kill these illumination guys. Things are just getting really bad. <laughs> many, Jack Marshall, many death marshals died, but... Uh, but Perdita did prove it. Thankfully, Perdita is very forgiving, so I was able to pull yeah, it out. Yeah, isn't she, though? <laughs> she is. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun. It was a great... Uh, that mm, Malifaux is... Not she's not. No. <laughs> no. No, she's forgiving as... Yes, Justice is very... Well, I should say, 
that uh, the guild is, is that my particular crew just does okay because basically it's hard to kill them all, so it's pretty good. Um, let's see. Oh, I just played. So we got Star Trek Catan at Gen Con. I think I mentioned this because um, we don't actually own a copy of Catan. I figured like we should because we're gamers and. And if you're going to only own one copy of Catan, it might as well be the Star Trek one because it's those cool little spaceships. So um, Nicole and I are trying to play We've got to play it, but Catan's a little three-player game. So we're, we go to the kids and we're like, hey, girls, do you want to play Star Trek Catan with us? And my youngest daughter, Kitch, says, well, do you get to fight each other? And I said, no, you don't really get to fight. It's really just about trading. And she looks at me and she goes, well, what's the point, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> That's my daughter right there. Exactly. Yeah, it was it was pretty fun, but they didn't Kit cut they, right to the chase. They were not they were not they were not impressed by it. I, I enjoyed it. That was pretty cool. But uh, oh, speaking of fighting, though, I played Battle Beyond Space. Actually, you got to you got to yell Battle Beyond Space, I which is super cheesy, really retro uh, styling, um, sort of Flash Gordon four player. They called it a one X game. You know, four X where you got exterminate, explore, expand. Uh, this is just one X exterminate. <laughs> and comes with four different fleets, and you basically very simple rules, but a lot of fun and a lot more fun than it has the right to be. It's by Z Man Games, a very fun little game. If you see it, it's worth getting. It's very affordable too, a nice little game. Um, and then um, let's see, Mike showed us a Sunrise City, which was a recent Kickstarter. This is the one that it's a tile laying city building game, and sort of like Carcassonne or maybe um, you know Infinite City or those kind of Infinite games. City, but yeah. but it builds in addition to building out, it builds up. Hmm. So like you get different stories and they, and they literally get stacked on top of each other, which is sort of interesting. And there's some interesting bidding mechanics and some other layers of, of complexity. Um, kind of neat, pretty, pretty fun. Um, then we played, um, zombie side, which was great fun. I'm still loving zombie side. We did die horribly this time. We did not even get close to winning. Uh, and we got the new zombie side app, which just came out recently, which basically is a, uh, sort of, there's a lot of new gaming aid apps coming out. Apps that are really not games in of themselves, but they're just sort of like there to be used at the table to help you play. And the Zombie Side app basically is for the iPad, and it it replaces your card, so it basically tracks the card for you, hmm. um, which is sort of fun. I think the placemats are actually more fun than it, but it it makes fun little zombie noises and things as you move your equipment <laughs> around, which is which is kind of fun. Um, played a couple games of Hordes. Um, played a couple campaign games with Ryan at 15 points, still having a blast with only like five or six models. That's also a fun game. Um, and finally played some more Spartacus as well with, uh, Ryan and Travis, uh, Travis, a new gentleman we just met and he, um, kicked our butt. He did a great move. He, um, I was trying, he had gotten the Spartacus gladiator and I, I figured if I could get Spartacus, mm. um, and I could get control of the, of the, um, of you know, the games next round and win with him, I would win the game because the way my setup, I was two points away. So I, Travis, I'm like, Travis, will you sell me Spartacus in the training phase? He goes, ah, I'll sell them to you for 10. <laughs> I'm like, 10's a lot, but I could totally win the game. Okay, and I gave it to him. Well, it turned out 10 was exactly what he needed to be able to pull off his move to keep me from getting the game, stall me one turn, and then win the next turn because he could trade all his stuff in and get bonus. <laughs> so it was a really, really cool move. So Spartacus, I don't know, Eric, did you get a chance to see Spartacus at all at Gen Con? No, I, I, I was chained to a booth. You're probably pretty busy, <laughs> yeah. It's a yeah. pretty interesting board game. Uh, if you like Rome, definitely worth checking that one out. Okay. So let's see. That's yeah. or or stabbing your friends in the back. It's that, good with that too. Which is basically. Right. I, I, yeah. I actually it actually reminds me of another game I played recently. Oh, what's that? Um, Diplomacy. Oh, you played old school. Wow. Nice. If, nice. You, if you want to lose your friends yes. and stab them in the back simultaneously, <laughs> um, yeah, we did a little diplomacy, and and uh, I'm still on victorious in that game. Now, <laughs> on victorious. Is, is, is anyone? <laughs> As in never. Is wow. anyone? Is anyone who you played still talking to you, or, or are you guys all in non-talking terms for a month now? Um, well, the month's just about up. Oh, good. It was actually a little bit ago. It was right after Gen Con. So, okay. But yeah, so, so I might get friends back. Nice. <laughs> Trick, trickling in. That's <laughs> nice. good. So let's see. Up next is modeling. Eric, um, do you get much chance to do any painting or building much anymore, or are you still so busy with the whole running the company thing? Well, the running the company thing is a bit of a chore, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, uh, all these plastics came in and they said, build them. And we had some people in the warehouse and they built them. And Nathan was like, do these people have like seven left hands? Because none of this looks right. <laughs> so he's like, Eric, you're going to, you're going to build this. Um, which actually might be kind of handy to have seven left hands. Um, but so, so yeah, I've been, I've been modeled, I've been plastic cementing stuff together like crazy. Nice. Now, how many, how many models um, do you think you built at this point? Which is don't you don't even get me started um 100 something wow wow yeah actually actually funny funny little point you know those uh puppet wars sprues that you're uh that you got in your hot little hand there mm-hmm. yeah 
um, we actually are sort of testing new stuff. And I said, what would be fun, more fun than just using these new plastic puppets as the proxies for things? So I have like a little army of uh, all executioners, like 10 executioners coming across the board at you. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I was like, we should, just, we should just turn that into a game in it of itself. Yeah, they look for those. The Puppet Wars plastics look fantastic. Those are so sweet looking. Um, I might just build a little crew. I gotta give them away. I wanna build, I wanna build a little crew of, I wanna build my whole War Machines pot. At uh, that was kind of funny. Um, all right, so let's see. Craig, what about you? What have you been doing for modeling? Uh, well, uh, for my, the 40K thing, I painted up the three mortar teams that I put together, which is really excited because I haven't actually painted any IG stuff in over a decade. So nice. I painted those up really quick. I did two stormtroopers so that I would have, I, I, I got the, uh, the elite force event which yep. allows you to flip the, your force org chart so that you can have as many of one other thing as you want instead of troops. And I just took a whole bunch of stormtroopers, which mm -hmm. was beautiful till they all got shot by the Necrons and died. Um, <laughs> but I needed some more troops, so I painted them up. And I started a ton, not nearly 100, but a ton of 10 Thunders models. Oh, nice. So all the models that I got at Gen Con, I had, I had put them together uh, for the most part. I mean, I think we were talking... Uh, last episode, we were talking that I had done everything except for the archers and that I had stalled out on the archers. I eventually just uh, used green stuff for their little neck cloths. And uh, I now, and this is where I followed Eric's advice and I primed everything white, mm -hmm. and, which is completely against my normal. Uh, my normal uh, policy. So if they come out crappy, I'm, I am going to blame Eric. <laughs> uh, and I've just it's, it's started. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't have anyone. I don't have any friends to back me up, so I'm vulnerable at the moment. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, good, good, good. That's kind of that's kind of what like, when I <laughs> so, like so blame strike. away. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited so far. I mean, I I got those uh, uh, from what is it? Uh, Secret Weapon Miniatures makes all kinds of different ba bases for all kinds of different games, and they have one that's called um, Zen Garden, yeah, which is all like bamboo pathways and. Um, and raked sand like a like a Zen garden, and thing and little rocks with the with the ban with the sand raked around them. And so I'm gonna I, I've painted up the entire crew or the ones that I have so far that so they're like standing on the on the uh, on the pathways, which is really cool because some of the bases have very little pathway on them, right. and those are the ones that I put the archers in really cool poses. Like there's one guy who's crouching down with just his toes touching the ground, and he's on just one little piece of path and so i think it's going to come out really cool so that's been a very exciting um for me i have built converted and or painted uh, a bunch of terrain a factory for dust slash 40k slash whatever might come around the bend like i don't know dystopian legions uh, a hospital likewise wow. for the same thing and i picked up a bunch of gw terrain for Malifo, the the GW fantasy stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I have the ruined tower that looks perfect for Malifo. Uh, all kinds of nooks and and not a lot of not very useful for actually Warhammer Fantasy, which is what it's theoretically built for. Because there's no way you're going to get a block of troops in there. But plenty of cool nooks and crannies for one or two models to hide in. And oh, I don't know, shoot arrows from. Nice. Uh, the GW chapel, and I just got the Garden of More, the big cemetery set um that's got all kinds of different mausoleums and stuff that i think when i finish it up is going to look really cool for malifo so uh nice. and i ordered a zuzzy mat another zuzzy mat so i'm gonna like i've just gone <laughs> all out i'm now gonna have two full three by three tables one outdoor one i mean one uh like country well it's swampy uh countryside and one uh inside the city so uh very excited about all the terrain stuff i'm doing also very nice very nice. That's and that's been me. Well, what about you, Russ? Let's see. Well, our friend Will has a very interesting way of getting his friends to play the same games he wants to play. Yeah, you know, you run campaigns, right? right. So what Will does is Will buys one of every faction available in the game, <laughs> and then gives them to his friends. Right. So, like, he really wants us to play Infinity, and I, I express some interest. I want to learn about Infinity, and let's just keep asking about Infinity. So, he's like. Here, Russ, which one do you like? Because I like these guys. He said, good, I, I own them myself. Fine, I'll paint them up for you. He's like, no, no, they're yours. I'm like, what are you doing? He gave them to me. A starter box, God bless you guys. So I've got those built, and I'm starting to work on I'm going to use some of Eric's techniques as well. Eric, I'm going to try out this whole uh, this whole shading thing here. We'll see what happens. 
I'm very excited to try it out. You guys are going to hate me when it doesn't work, aren't you? <laughs> gonna it's going to look like kindergartners. I'm going to put pictures on Twitter and say, this is what Eric made me do. <laughs> what are these big, ugly, gray stripes? <laughs> what happened? Um, no, I'm actually really excited to try it out because they're very anime, right? So it's I think that kind of technique will look good on anime. Um, mm-hmm. uh, let's see. Um, I've been touching up my old horde stuff. I brought my troll bloods out, so I touched those up, and I've been painting on painting some more machine models with my daughter and she's really enjoying it still. And, uh, and yeah, so it's, we're having a great time with that as well. So that's still going forward as well. So just a little, a couple of little modeling things, but yeah, we're getting there. Very nice. Let's see. What about other gaming? Eric, how about you? What about other geeky stuff you've been doing? Like any movies you've seen, books you read, anything like that? Um, I just got a great book actually. Um, it's brand new called playing at the world. Ooh. I don't know if you've heard of this thing. I have not. Uh, and I, I've, I've only, I've only gotten about, uh, 30 pages into it, but this book is about a history. Here's the, here's the subtitle, a history of simulating wars, people and fantastic adventures. Basically it takes a look at how society went from nothing to to having ways of simulating combat. So, you know, it's, it's, it really, you know, goes back to, it basically just, it figures out how we're, how we're here in, in in terms of gaming. It's about, uh, the size of a large brick, 600 something pages. Wow. So, so it really gets into it. So I'll tell you how it is next year. Um, <laughs> right. What's it called again? It's called playing at the world. Playing at the world. Oh, from awesome. chess, from chess to role playing games. So, so yeah, I mean, it's so far, it's a fantastic read. If you want to know about how, how and why we're doing what we're doing um, and how we got here as a gaming culture. Uh, that's my big thing. That's that's been a uh, you know weighing down my. <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> six hundred pages. Uh, Holy. Yeah, yeah. It's, nice. it's six hundred pages, and it's far, far, far small. Too wow, small that is not a cheap book. <laughs> not not enough pictures, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's amazing. It's one it's of the best. Nice. Free ever. with super saving shipping from uh, Amazon, though. Nice. Wow, nice. that is. Um, but yeah, that, I mean that's that's sort of been my uh, my time killer lately um, in terms of just sort of solo geeking because as you might have heard, I don't have many friends at the moment. Um, now what happened? <laughs> oh, was it was was it that diplomacy game? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like yeah, no, it's it was it was the uh, no one told me that Gen Con was this hard, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I'm like, well, I kind of hinted at it. They're like, yes, but. You didn't cry and scream to, to <laughs> illustrate just what was going to happen. Brutality of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I mean, so, so yes, reading a book about the history of gaming has been, has been a lot of fun. <laughs> nice. Well, that's um, good. Yeah. Very good. It's available on the Kindle. I'm excited. There you go. It is. Easier to carry around than a 600 page brick. That's so. true. <laughs> yes, but, but less good for self-defense. Oh, good point. <laughs> Very <laughs> true. Or as a doorstop, right? It doesn't serve either. Exactly. Nice. Um, anything else? A- any movies lately, Eric? Um, you know, I have a two-year-old, so. Oh, yes. I remember those <laughs> days. Yes. So going going to movies doesn't yeah. happen that much. I remember. Um, however, I'm learning a whole lot of games about arranging colors and putting <laughs> blocks through the holes that are the same shape as them. Nice. Um, nice. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm getting back to the roots here. Very good. Very <laughs> there you go. Foundational re- research. Yeah. I found well, it. It's, it, it's, a, it's amazing because I'm like, wow, I could turn a game into like arranging colors. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. We, we have one in development. Now. <laughs> right. <laughs> you should see the plastics for it. They're gonna amazing. Start that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you'll, you, you never know. <laughs> going to kickstart the heck out of that. <laughs> right. But, but it's amazing because we're, we're arranging colors in the office now and people are like, Wow, there's a lot of depth to this. I'm like, yeah, not so much with a two year old, but yes. <laughs> right. It could be like invention, except you just figure out where to go in the color wheel. Does blue exactly. come between purple and red? I, yeah. Um, all right. Great. That's that's good stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Craig, what so about it? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Made up games for us. Nice. <laughs> at the I, moment. Nice. I, I, awesome. I remember those days. A lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and not, not much sleep, though. It's the only downside. That's, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Craig, what about you? What have you been, what have you been uh, doing uh, on the non-gaming? Uh, well, um, I meant to do this at the front of this segment, but I'm going to do it really quickly. I uh, I want to just give a quick shout out to the thank or of thanks to the five folks that I chose as uh, randomly with uh, 
percentile dice as winners for my little thing that I did for Jever Notice. And that is uh, Mike Bauscher, Dwayne Westerhausen, Will Hoyt, Chris Vasco, and Tom Mason. Mm. Tom Mason of miniature sculpting fame. Nice. And, uh, yeah, so I, I actually... See if you can hear that. That is actually the packages with the um, with the patches and some buttons and a little extra bonus in each envelope for those guys. So thank you very much, guys. Um, I it really meant a lot for you guys to reach out at that moment. Uh, I am, as far as my reading goes, I'm still reading Team of Rivals, which I think oh, yeah? I wouldn't realize how long it's taking if I wasn't saying every two weeks, I'm still reading Team of Rivals. <laughs> so the bad thing about the Kindle is I have no idea how many pages this book is that I'm reading. I only know that I'm only 45% done. <laughs> and the, prob- the, the, one, the one saving grace, as far as I'm concerned, with nonfiction books that I've learned in the Kindle is that you get really discouraged when you see the percentage and then you hit the uh, footnotes. Like, <laughs> oh, thank God. It's like 20% footnotes. I'll be okay. Now, I don't know if Team of Rivals has any footnotes, though. So, uh, <laughs> Although I'm in, I'm in 1864, and I'm pretty sure Lincoln's going to die soon. So I don't know uh, <laughs> like how 55% of the book can keep going, but I don't know. It's a long funeral I, scene. Exactly. I'm still right. enjoying it. Uh, I'm still fascinated by Lincoln and everything that's going on in that time period. Nice. Uh, really, really enjoying that. Well, I'm listening. Hey, What's that? Maybe a little something about John Wilkes Booth being removed from the time stream. Oh right! Oh, that might have never known. That might have. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's why he doesn't die, it's right? A side story. There's and then there's a side story about how John Booth <laughs> as a baby was Evil um, yeah. saved by the baby orphanage. That's there right. you go. One, uh, one so I'm listening side. to the Far Side of the Stars, which is book three of the Lieutenant Leary series by yeah. David Drake, uh, which I'm enjoying. I'm still finding the reader kind of bedtime story ish, mm-hmm. which is really weird because this book is really super. Um, swashbuckling and adventuring in the back of beyond and they're in the barbarian elements of space at this point and and we're le- reading like this daniel leary looked over at and i was like seriously oh my god uh, but the story itself is really really cool and i was wrong last time when i said that david drake's little intro is is the same they're actually different at, at the front of each of his audiobooks, and he's actually explaining a little bit about where the inspiration came for each book. So it's really neat to hear him. And he also gets a he gets a narrator credit for that five minute little blurb, which is intriguing. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> uh, and of course, if you if this sounds interesting to you, you might want to go to audible.com. Audible.com. Yeah, check out. We'll go to our website and click on our Audible yeah, logo. Stuff. Because then you will get our good Audible deal, which is, of course, a free Audible credit, which gets you one book of your choice pretty much from Audible, as well as 30 days of Audible membership, which gets you all kinds of great deals, and you get to f- try the service and see if it works. And even if you cancel the service and pay nothing, you still get that free book you got with the Audible credit. So that is a win-win situation. It was great. This week was another one of those four ninety nine sales, yep. and they had the entire Dresden Files series for four ninety nine dollars each. <laughs> That is it a good was, deal, especially in audio crazy. format. It was great. And, and those audio are great narrator on those books, too. They're awesome. Oh, they're they're fantastic. So definitely check that out if you're interested in audiobooks, which which I am. Yeah, speaking of audiobooks, I am reading a book that I cannot recommend highly enough. A listener out there, I am so sad I forgot your name. So I think you tweeted me uh, this recommendation. It is called The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. Have you heard of this book, right, Craig? Uh, I have been, listeners have been recommending Joe Abercrombie to me for oh. about a year and a half now. I don't know about the rest of his works. I have not gotten around to it yet. This I, book. He wrote like The Black Company and all those too, I think. Yeah, I don't know. But this this book, The Blade itself, it's yeah. called The the First Law, Book One. So it's clearly part of a series. Um, I haven't got to the end of it. The only critical s- reviews I've seen of it on Audible are basically that it doesn't stand by itself. You really want the next book to come. But I, it's just so well written. The dialogue is so fantastic. The narrator is awesome. Um, it's a fantasy book, um, but it's got politics, it's got uh, swordplay, it's got action, it's got magic, um, all of it, but not in ways you've seen before. Uh, really, really well done. The The dialogue is just fantastic, and the narrator does a great job. Not only does he change voices and everything with different characters, but one of the characters, the main character, uh, one of the sort of anti-hero character, the Inquisitor, um, up front you learn the Inquisitor was, was captured and tortured by the enemy before he became back part of the Empire and became an Inquisitor again, and they chiseled out every other tooth in his mouth oh. when he was tortured. So 
he can't chew anything because it's every other tooth, right? So the top teeth at his bottom gums and the bottom teeth at his top gums. Oh. So when the narrator talks, the, the guy lisps, right? But only when he talks. So and the, and the and the dialogue writing style of this book is so excellent. It's one of those books where the guy will they'll be in a dialogue scene and character A will speak, character B will respond, character A will think about what he's really thinking, but then t- say something else, right? So you'll hear his inner monologue kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but this guy, when the narrator talks, when he's speaking as the character, he adds the lisp. But when he's not speaking as the character, he remove. When he's thinking as the character, he removes the lisp. But he still has the same accent for that particular character. The whole it's really, really well done. Very, very good book, uh, uh, and a very, very good audio presentation. And the story's really great. I think you will love this one. So, the blade um, itself, check it out. No, they're not saying. super. I've heard they're like really super dark, and uh, there's no good guys, and it's kind of nihilistic as well. No, I've that heard. would be Game of Thrones. Yeah, this is no, not like Game that. Game of Thrones has good guys. They just don't win. Name, name a good guy in Game of Thrones. Uh, Ned Stark. Okay, one. No, but this actually no. There's there's um well there's shades of gray in this book. Like there's different people that are evil. Yeah. Um So it's d- shades of evil. Well, but even Ned Stark's not necessarily a good guy. He killed the former king. So it depends how you look at it. So it's, this book's got the same thing like that. But there's not. It's not as. It's not as dark as Game of Thrones because Game of Thrones, all the good guys die and all the stuff is bad guys pretty much, right? In this, right. In this, so this one, this one just like started that. with all bad guys. Uh, they're not even really all bad guys. They're just sort of because even the even the Inquisitor who's doing things that are pretty bad is also kind of a good guy. It's sort of uh-huh. it's okay. It's, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. I'll deep character development. Let's go there. How's that? I'll give it a try. All right. Uh, and I was wrong. He did. That's Black Company. I guess is not his. He's got all kinds of other books though. So it yeah. looks like if you like this book, there's a. Uh, a whole bunch of other ones you can and and the people he's getting blurbs from is pretty crazy. He's got uh, George R R Martin wrote oh, a blurb. Really good. Uh, Patrick Rothfuss, the author of The Name of the Wind. So a lot of our I like it as I like it as much them. I like it as much of the name as The Name of the Wind, and it doesn't really at all to Harry Potter, which is even better. So I have to yeah, you just <laughs> go back to that well again, my friend. How can you not? So quickly, uh-huh. because we're running out of time here. Also, but uh, finished up le- the first season of Legend of Korra. I, uh, Eric, do you like anime? Do you watch any anime? Um, I used to. Did you ever watch yeah. um, The Last Airbender, that whole series? I did, the entire yeah. thing. Yeah, so yeah, so uh, Legend of Korra is the sequel. It just came out this spring. Really yeah, I actually, actually was, I was I saw someone reviewing that on YouTube, and I was like, I got to see that, and, not, and I totally forgot about it, so no. I'm going to write it down. Definitely check yeah. it out. It's really, really good, and it's available on a digital medium. You get it on iTunes, you get it on Xbox Video, whatever you want to get it on. It's really good. Um also did go go out and see Indiana Jones and IMAX. Oh, how jealous am I? Well, okay. So it was uh-oh, great to see uh-oh. it. Well, no, I love Indiana Jones. I have the biggest right. fanboy. I have the hat, the whole thing. Oh, as Official do I. Indiana Jones Stetson. But And at my daughter's, you know, uh, one of our listeners just said, hey, I heard your daughters fell in love with Star Wars because of the Lego Star Wars. Well, they also fell in love with Indiana Jones because of the Lego Indiana Jones game. So <laughs> they wanted to see it. And uh, so I took them. They liked it. It was great. It was a fantastic scene on the screen with the music blaring and the theme music and the whole thing. And it's still a fantastic movie. But it should have been, I wish it wasn't an IMAX because it wasn't filmed for IMAX. And you can definitely see, it's almost like watching a low def video and a high def TV. You know, oh, you can really yeah. see the imperfections of the film. And it almost been like, it was nice being on the big screen. I'd better rather have it on a normal big screen than IMAX. And it was not shown on normal screens. You got to pay the IMAX prices for a non IMAX movie. So uh, it might as well be negative, but it was, it was still awesome. It was awesome. Oh, and one word of warning. Ooh, we got a little music going on. That's my whip. There you go. Nice. Um, <laughs> Craig's got apps. <laughs> uh-huh. No, no, it's not an app. It's a whip. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I'll turn it off now. <laughs> so also, I, ha- I have to warn our listeners right now. If you are considering that that new series called Revolution, you think it might be kind of fun to watch, and you kind of TiVo'd it, and you haven't seen the first episode... Do yourself a favor and just delete it without watching it. Actually, do yourself a favor and don't listen to Russ. Oh, my God. That's a bad show. I enjoyed it immensely. What are you talking about, dude? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. We must have watched two different shows. The writing was the worst writing ever. Not even close. Oh, man. It was an no, awful. If we're, if we're using Avatar as the worst writing ever, this isn't even in the same universe. Oh, it was bad. No, I oh, disagree. Goodness. I disagree immensely. All right. Well, if you like I the really show. I really enjoyed it. If you like the show, send emails if you to like, Craig. Uh, if you like uh, <laughs> shows that have like a really interesting premise and some interesting, interesting premise? characters. And- Electricity doesn't work, but the law Lawns are still mowed 15 years later. Oh, what? for the love of God. What? Have you ever heard of goats? <laughs> what are they? Are they <laughs> heard of heard goats? Of goats crop grass, And my wait, friend. and wait, wait. They've got a device that can make one computer work. 
okay? It's yeah. 2,000 or whatever. There's 20. You have no and idea what's the going The one here. computer that works is from 1981 with a DOS prompt. Okay, so if you are an egg, really? computer egghead, right? Oh, wait. And OCD wait. about no, wait. computers that okay. don't Let's watch take the guns. Show. Let's take the guns. They've got guns left over from when the power went out in like 2012, right? What are they all firing for guns? Muskets. Well, and where? The why hell do you find why, muskets? Because why would you send a small <laughs> unit out into a contested countryside where the <laughs> rebels could get your really good guns? You wouldn't. You Wait, would send but them. where are you getting the you muskets? Send, where do you go? The museum to get the muskets? No. Come <laughs> on. You're running out of ammunition in the big battle. It's 2012. <laughs> where are the muskets coming I don't from? You are, I don't know you anymore. This is craziness. <laughs> this is such ridiculous nitpicking. I don't even know where it's coming from. Oh, man. Well, Seriously, okay. You haven't brought up one thing yet that in my head I am not completely convinced it's not an issue. <laughs> All right, fine. Well, your mileage apparently may vary on Revolution. Oh, it's either the I best television show ever or people in the future the using mus- muskets. That's the bitch where we are. It's the best television point. show ever. <laughs> this show is quite good. That's what I said. Wow. You cannot wow. pull your little, your little, your little All right. tricks about c- getting me into like Eric, have you, where this have is you the seen best this? show ever. Eric, can you break the tie here? Have you seen Revolution yet? I, I, I have, and I have to go with the, the muskets are crazy argument. <laughs> Okay, well, you know. There we go. Sanity. Um, maybe I'm weird. <laughs> Sanity from the man who invented Malifo. There it is right there. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, that... you know, we don't we don't even have muskets in Malifo and that's set 120 years ago. <laughs> Good point. See? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Maybe the, muskets, maybe the muskets aren't that great. Idea. I don't know, but uh, you know what? Uh, will, my willing suspension of disbelief has not yet been burst. Good. So. Okay, great. There you go. There you go. I got it. You came in on this one. <laughs> Don't watch it. Erase your television. In fact, throw Seriously. your television out the window it's bad. if you accidentally recorded it. It's bad. It's, it really is. It's anyway, bad. well, we'll let it go with that. There you go. There you have it. That's achievements. That is achievements before we kill each other. <laughs> you You're listening to the D6 Generation. Born to gain. Ow. Lone Wolf in California. Uh, I've got to tell you, man. So Russ can make fun of me all he wants, but I'm enjoying playing Warhammer 40,000 again. Loser. Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 what? what? Nothing. Loser, no, no. Loser says what? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, clever. And uh, I am just all over Army Builder, of course, because that's where you go when you're starting up a new game or a game that you're you're not as familiar with as you could be or any game right. that you want to kind of max and min and look look for all your different points. That's our quick And place. so these 40K games are 555 points, so they're really small, small forces. So you right. really need to get everything in there that you can. Mm-hmm. Um, and the one way to do that without a calculator and a piece of paper and a pencil and an mm-hmm. eraser mm-hmm. is Army Builder. Right. And that is just awesome. And there's nothing else out there that works nearly as well as Army Builder. But Army yep. Builder is not the only thing that Lone Wolf provides for you. No, Russ, what else do. does Lone Wolf provide? Well, Hero Lab is one of my favorites, which is a great way to crank out your favorite RPG character for most of the major systems. Uh, including Shadowrun and other great systems. Um, and don't forget also that Hero Lab and Army Builder are now both available on the Mac. Yeah, so if you're an Apple yeah. fan, not to worry. You can do your favorite gaming stuff there as well. Um, and also keep a lookout for other fine hotness coming near uh, soon, like uh, like uh, Ro- Romeworks, which I can't Realm wait. They're showing it again at Gen Con. I cannot wait. That is the ultimate way mm-hmm. to manage your fantasy campaign. Really, pretty much now between that and Hero Lab, you have everything you need to play any RPG as either the GM or the player. Oh, it's craziness. Good stuff. So craziness. check out LoneWolfDevelopment.com and also follow them on Twitter at LoneWolfDevel. Devel. And now, what's in the news? With the shout out, it takes influence, bribery, and blackmail to be the head of the four families, but... It's Nothing Personal, coming soon to Kickstarter.com. <laughs> nothing Personal, name of the game, kind of wigged it into the pretty clever. <clears throat> anyway, and now, the news. Up first, we got some Fantasy Flight Games news. Now, this is pretty exciting. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the video game uh, industry, you'll know that there's a very 
well-known magazine, Game Informer, and it's, it's well-circulated, well-known, pretty much because if you walk into a GameStop, they essentially throw it at you. Uh, but Game Informer is well-circulated, and it was interesting to see in last month's Game Informer a very large three-page spread on none other than Fantasy Flight Games, and not some kind of video game tie-in. No, they had pictures of all their big events going on at Gen Con, and a big discussion on the rise of board games. Very, very interesting to see in a video game magazine. So that's pretty exciting. And if you look carefully, you'll spot a picture of Ross Watson in the Dust Tactics tables. <laughs> kind of cool. Uh, in other Fantasy Flight Games news, if you are excited about X-Wing as the folks here at the D6 Generation are, oh, it's awesome, baby! Fantasy Flight just uh, officially announced the expansions coming out, the uh, Millennium Falcon, the A-Wing, the TIE Interceptor, and all that good stuff on their website. But in addition to that, the new article also has pictures of the cards included with the ships, as well as some hints of who the pilots will be, including Lando, Han Solo, of course, and many others for different craft, as, as well as Slave One, other good stuff. So definitely check that out if you're an X-Wing fan. Hmm. Uh, ooh, let's see also. Ooh, in other board game news, there's Zombie Side's got a bunch of new stuff coming out. Let's see, the Zombie Side campaign was just released for free. PDF download. If you go to kickstarter.com and search for Zombie Side, you'll see it. And this is a new multi-part campaign you can play with your Zombie Side game. That's pretty interesting. Also available is the Zombie Side Companion iPad app. This app allows you to track your favorite survivor on the iPad itself. Kind of replaces the whole survivor mat. Pretty neat. Russ tried it out. Oh, it's pretty cool. Did you like it, Wakeland? Well, it's just harder to find the cards, but it's all cool. So he liked it. I guess uh, any, any complaints? No, if you can control more than one survivor, it's a little tricky. Otherwise, it's pretty good. Okay, there you have it, the iPad app. Um, oh, also, it's free, by the way, too. So you might as well try it out. It does make cool zombie brains noises. You know, nothing wrong with that. Uh, also, just one final bit of zombie side news, it's now shipping. So uh, you should be able to find your local zombie side pretty soon in a local store. But if you can't, you can always head over to coolminiornot.com and buy it directly from them. Uh, oh, and in miniature wargaming news, the well-known White Dwarf magazine from Games Workshop is getting a reboot. Uh, significant staff changes, and there's going to be a whole new look and feel. The new issue should be hitting store shelves pretty soon if it isn't already there. And if you're interested about that, head over to the Games Workshop website and visit the White Dwarf section. You'll find all the articles on the new changes to White Dwarf. So hopefully it'll return to some of its former glory. Uh, back in the day, it was quite the fun magazine to look through. Uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, also, we mentioned uh, some Kickstarter stuff. Another Kickstarter that's well known is the Dreadball Kickstarter, which features the new Mantic sort of futuristic uh, sports game, kind of like Blood Bowl in the future, if you will. And big tie-in there, uh, they just announced they have a Penny Arcade tie-in, and there's an official Penny Arcade figure now available with the Dread, Dread Ball thing. That's kind of neat. Oh, this is interesting. FASA is back. Uh, FASA is an old gaming company, originally did a bunch of interesting games, and they are returned, apparently, with some of their original folks, as well as some new people. Uh, the properties they'll be focusing on look like uh, some old classics you might remember, including Fading Suns, Earth Dawn, Demon World, and Blue Planet. If you're interested in FASA, check them out at fasagames.com. Uh, and finally, we mentioned iPad earlier. Uh, Mech Warrior Tactical Command is now available on iPad. Oh, it's awesome. Really, Wakeland, because the thing's $10. $10 is a lot for an iPad. But it's basically Mech Warrior Mech Commander 2 on an iPad. Mm. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, really. Only 21 missions, but 21 missions of awesome. All right, so apparently Wakeland likes it. Apparently there's some good cutscenes. Apparently fully voiced dialogue. Apparently all the mechs look really cool and realistic. You can zoom in and out. You can control your mechs go. The interface is pretty good. So if you're a Mech Warrior fan, it's a no-brainer. But even if you're not, 10 bucks, a little bit pricey. But if you compare that to the price of a full-on video game, it's pretty affordable. And that's What's in the News. This is the D6 Generation Podcast. More fun than Merchant of Venus. Wait, what? Who writes this? That's impossible. And welcome back. Uh, you guys will, of course, remember that several episodes ago, we had uh, Neil Fawcett from Spartan Games on talking all about resins and the challenges of resin and all that sort of stuff uh, when you're going to make uh, your models out of resin. Well, we have, of course, as you all know, with us, Eric Johns from Weird Miniatures. And, of course, anybody who's not living under a rock knows mm -hmm. that Weird Miniatures just made a huge transition at Gen Con and is starting to crank out all of these new plastics. So we thought, the, we, we've covered resin, and now it's time to cover plastics. So, right. Eric, we're going to grill you on what plastics is all about. I really shouldn't let you guys know how much I, I've been thinking about plastics lately. It's, gonna, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to go well. <laughs> the email about you dreaming about plastics was really what locked it for us. <laughs> it really was. Yeah. Like, uh, 
Yeah, let's let, and Eric, that's a great segue into sort of the first topic, I guess. It's like mm-hmm. um obviously Weird's been doing metals fantastically well for for many, many years. So what I mean, I know everybody and their and their cousin will tell you it's the it's the volatile cost of metals, but is is that really what drove what drives that kind of decision making? I mean, how long have you guys been looking at plastics, and how long did you think about this before you decided, okay, this is something we really want to jump into? Well, it's it's, it's been a really distressing trend, um, just in the cost of metal, and and yeah, as much as you might want to avoid talking about the cost of metal, you, yeah. just, you just can't. Okay, um, uh, just just to sort of give you an idea about the cost of metal. Um, you know, you, people tend to know our Lord Chompy bits, the big old giant yeah. chunk of metal. Right. When we cast that originally, it was, uh, I think it was like eight bucks of metal, like just a big chunk. Of, and we thought that was amazingly expensive. Mm-hmm. And um, our metal guy at the beginning of the year, and he probably shouldn't have done this because he's probably looking back at this and, and cursing <laughs> himself. But he, but he, but uh, apparently he was laughing because he was like, oh, I just priced it out. That would now cost $24 of metal. Oh, so, Wow. So, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you can't, you can't really just be like, well, the cost of the metal isn't a right. big factor. Right. Um, and it really is the primary factor. Uh, and going forward, I, I, you know, unless someone figures out something to do with metals, you're going to see less and less metal miniatures because you just can't get around it. Mm. Right. So that's, well, that's, that, and that, that does, that's a great illustration. I mean, three times the cost in, yeah. in those few years it's been out. That's, that's uh, incredible. I think I rounded down on the first one and rounded up on the second one just okay. to, just to make it seem just more to make impressive. it sound really yeah. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You know, if you're going to use propaganda, you're not supposed to tell us. Right. Damn it. <laughs> I like the honesty, though. See, that's the kind of thing we can expect mm. from Weird Miniatures. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, so now is so when you get in, and we'll get into how you you know make the transition to metal. Were there any sort of like happy discoveries as you were going into plastics that that um, we're sort of like, oh, there's some extra benefits aside from cost, or has it pretty much been curses, but it's cheaper, so we're going this way? You know. Kind of oh, thing. I mean, it's a, I, well, I mean, the biggest thing is there's just a whole. It's a completely different process. So, mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of things now we're being like, oh, that, yeah, that's way easier. Where at first it was like, oh, this is I can't even start to fathom how to it's like sprue design and yeah. other things, which give you just a headache and wake you up screaming at night. <laughs> um, but then, you know, in retrospect, we're like, oh, it's actually now a lot easier. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's just, I mean, really, it's just the learning curve. And once you get on top of it, it's, it's not, and we're still, we're still on the curve. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 there, there are benefits there. I mean, there are definitely things now in retrospect, like, oh, we should be done this from the first miniature we ever made. So. Oh, interesting. Now, have, has the plastic technology, I mean, how long have you guys been looking at it, I guess, first, the, the idea of going to plastic at, at Weird? Is it something recent or has it been a couple of years you've been eyeing it or? We've actually been, um. We actually started, you know, speaking of resins, we actually started by eyeballing resin mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. going that direction. And um, actually, if, if you guys know Puppet Wars, right. or, yeah. a Puppet Wars was originally going to be all resin. Oh. Uh, and then then we got a box full of resin puppets, and they were in 17 pieces <laughs> inadvertently. Uh-huh. Um, oh, right. See, it broke, would break, and, and there was flash everywhere. So we're like, yeah, we can't really use it for that. And actually, you know, if you look at our um, some of our avatars, we still have resin pieces chunks mm-hmm. big pieces in there are resin so there are advantages to resin as well um so yeah it's really been a year and a half since we really started looking at it seriously yeah. um but really once we once we I ruled out resin is when we when we seriously um when we seriously started looking into plastics i could imagine resin being tough i mean it, it works game for great for a company like spartan where they're, they're boats and they're sort of compact and but yeah so many of the weird models have really thin long wings and little Fiddly bits oh, yeah. that I could just see yeah. snapping right off in resin, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's what you would see, like Seamus's body, the big hulking Seamus avatar right. that was perfect for resin, or like the flame of the big chunk of flame underneath the, the Sonya avatar, perfect for resin because nothing's snapping off. Sure. You get good detail. Um, but yeah, once you start going smaller, it's just it's a brittle material. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so, okay. So you looked at resin and that was, that was sort of a, unfortunately for what most of what you guys do, that was a no go. So, so then you started looking at plastics. Now is, has plastic technology changed a lot in recently to make it a more viable option? And the reason you didn't look at it at the beginning, or is it just most of the guy, your initial sculptors and your, and your production guys were all familiar with metal. So that's how you started. Well, it, yeah, I mean, pretty much with, if you go to resin or if you go to a PVC plastic, mm-hmm. um, which is was another option on the table. Um, you don't have to change your processes. You can oh, right. still use your physical sculptors. You can still use your your mold making technology, and it's just that type of material. So you can still use your existing technologies, and um, 
and really not have to reinvent your wheel that you right. know which is driving your machine sure um whereas you know once you once you go into to to the polyethylene polystyrene plastics and injection molding and big chunks of of milled aluminum <laughs> you know you're, it's a whole different ball game um and yeah, when we were looking at it, we just, we as a company had been sort of looking around at decisions other companies been, had made and, and the advantages and disadvantages of the different materials. And we decided that the advantage of, of this harder polystyrene based um, plastics were the way to go. And so we went about reinventing our wheel. Now, um, Eric, can you like walk us through the process of the, like, the first steps of the transition? Like, so you've decided to take the plastic. But now you've got all these models in metal and your designs are continuing to be made. Are, d is the design process itself the same when you're making for plastic versus metal? It's actually remarkably similar um, because it all starts with art. It all starts uh -huh. with, you know, we have a line guy who does a bunch of line art. And we, um, I mean, the main, the big, the biggest difference from the start is that, um, that physical sculptors are more comfortable kind of improvising, it seems like. Uh -huh. So you uh -huh. just kind of give them a picture and they like just do the back and you don't have to worry about it. You're like, oh, cool. You threw a, you know, a knife on the guy's uh, belt and, you know, uh -huh. whatever. <laughs> whereas, whereas, you know, we started sending these to digital sculptors and, and digital sculptors will look at it and be like, what does the back look like? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. So we went back to our line guy and said, hey, how about drawing backs of everything now? <laughs> <laughs> That's really the, that was really the big difference. And, you know, the, the, originally the, the, the digital sculptor was like, hey, can we have tops and sides too? And we're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I actually don't like them. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, I mean, that's the biggest difference, but I mean, otherwise it all just starts with, with right. me and Nathan chatting okay. about what something to look like. Okay. So you, so your art is in the process of constantly being made and updated and I'm sure you've got all kinds of stuff in the pipeline. You've decided to go into plastics. What are the first steps? Like, did you start with, with one model or like, where do you go from that decision? Yes, we've decided we're going to go to plastics. What's next? Well, it's funny enough. Uh, I actually returned to puppet wars. Oh. Um, yeah, we, we tried out we tried out our resin with puppet wars, and we tried out our. Uh, uh -huh. We actually had we were like, well, these are good puppets, and they're tiny, so we need, we need a different size of base. Um, so we got a custom base made for puppet wars, uh -huh. and that was our first sort of interaction with that company. And um, you know, it was a different process. There's no art. I kind of had to just talk it through with them, and we got a base. Um, and then we got you know, a hundred thousand bases, and we're like, yeah, it's a pretty <laughs> little uh, process. Um, yeah, and so it really, really kind of goes back to Puppet Wars with both us testing out resins and plastics, um, and we sort of learned the learned the process and learned what the costs involved were, and sort of the rest is history. So I guess when you're breaking down the model, so so the um, mm -hmm. so there's a th let me just make sure I'm understanding right. So the the line artist does the the visual right. You get the idea what the miniature's going to look like front and back, right. and then your 3D modeler comes out and he models the perfect sort of three dimensional inside of a computer image of the character that rotates and you can see exactly what it's going to look like right now ideally, ideally yes it comes out perfect the first time but <laughs> right so after they get but, into the computer how do you break it down into the little parts that are going to go on the sprue how do you make that call well that is one of the sources of frustration and the learning curve <laughs> because because they like to be like okay well we just broke it down and here's your parts and we're like we like to be like no those parts don't need to be separate please put them back together <laughs> And that's actually one of the what happened at Gen Con. We got a piece that we got a miniature. And we're like, wow, her face is not part of her head. That's not <laughs> that's not what the call we would make. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not joking. That's what happened. We're like, wow, that face is not. It's it's about the size of a baby's pinky nail, and you need to glue it onto someone's head. Um, now, who it, was that? Misaki. That was the Oiron. Oh, okay. That's why we had them there and they weren't for sale. Um, wow. But so since then, we've sort of revised our process in the last few weeks mm -hmm. where we get to look at things closely before, <laughs> before uh. they go into production. But, um, but yeah, so it's sort of a, you know, from a plastic and molding stand standpoint, you know, they like to break it down as many pieces as possible because you can't, you know, with these plastics, you can't have undercuts. Mm -hmm. um, this, it just doesn't work. Um, so the more they break it down, the more, pieces they can get with preserving their quality 3d digital mm -hmm. whereas we were constantly like ah, oh, you can compromise a little bit to keep the face on the model <laughs> right right so is it a balancing act between uh, i mean i guess the considerations are you know one um 
they want to break it down to the point where that it's the most efficient injection process as possible, right, I guess. And then the balancing act against that is, well, what is it going to be like for some poor gamer to try to assemble this guy? Is that sort of right. the... No, I, I'm, I might have missed... Now, who is... It's the people who are doing the molding and making making the plastic moldings that are making the call to how many to break, shapes to break it into? Well, we, we got lucky. We the, the plastic manufacturer also has a digital sculpting studio. So we oh, okay. sort of... With that so it's all it's all sort of one entity that we're dealing gotcha. with and, and they're they're very friendly and they do a great job <laughs> just uh, um there's some tug of, tug of war there definitely uh-huh. oh, um, yeah. but it, there are big advantages because um their lead sculptor is, is both amazing and she also um does the sort of cutting up and uh-huh. sees everything so she knows how to sculpt so that it will mold well whereas uh-huh. if you just do something from someone who hadn't wasn't hadn't sort of existed in the mold making process might yeah. might throw out something that is like oh this literally needs to be 77 parts um uh-huh. and be good but yeah i mean but the but there's a third sort of variable that you, i mean I, you know all those uh and thinking back to old plastics and i think back to games workshop orcs and grots gr- mm-hmm. and things like that where where literally where there should be an undercut there's just a big sort of solid chunk of plastic that with no design on it right <laughs> um so that, that's this that's the other sort of consideration is you don't want that as much as possible right because you're paying for plastic you're not using right is that sort of the idea it just doesn't look that good <laughs> well that too right so um yeah I, I was gonna say it looks like a big giant blank space <laughs> exactly so does this so does this whole process um does it end up taking about the same as it would have taken to do a, a metal model or is there more iterations does it take longer or is it or do you feel like over time you'll get faster at it and it'll be about the same i think it's i mean like everything it's different Mm -hmm. each individual model definitely takes longer but since they're we're sort of working with a studio with multiple sculptors instead of you know when you have physical sculptor they they have two sets of hands and they can literally um do one model at a time um but you you have sculptors that have two sets of hands at weird that is weird. Oh, see that makes everything make sense. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how we got where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I I digress. Yeah, so, so you have so, yes, the limitations. So each, yeah, each individual model takes longer, but you can be working on about ten of them at once. Um, so if you have a large project like oh, I don't know, trying to do all the models for a book in a in a short time period, you can you can add more fit <laughs> to that. Well, that makes sense. No. Um, so can you now, just, oh, the, go ahead, Craig. Okay. Well, I just had a quick question because you said that uh, over the last couple of weeks you've addressed some of these issues. And uh, I was wondering, like, it, by addressing the issues, you mean the, the, the models that hadn't been released yet you'd fixed? Or are there any sort of changes to sprues of the, sh- the, the models that you've been selling since Gen Con that, that might happen also? I was curious. Pretty much anything that we didn't like yeah. gets sold. Ah, uh, gotcha. I mean, and that's actually one of the, the reasons why you know, the rail crew wasn't at Gen Con and in the end it showed up and it wasn't up to par and it was a really amusing mistake. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, basically, basically we tell them heights and they said, Oh, you know, and if, if May Fang has these rails underneath her sort of sculpted on and molded on. So they took her height to be the height of everything plus the rails. So she was kind of a, she was a midget. <laughs> Oops. So we, sent that, we sent that one back and said redo that <laughs> yeah, so, so there, there, there are interesting and fun pitfalls that you just don't ever come into contact with when you're uh, when you're doing physical modeling it's the stuff you don't even think of um, right. just stuff like that so um, have you now Eric have you, have you been to the facility have you seen how it works can you sort of describe I think most of our listeners have heard us talk before about how the the metal manufacturing process works. You know, you pour it into the into the spin molds and that whole thing. Can you describe how the plastic manufacturing process works and what makes it, you know, f- sort of briefly soup to nuts? How does it kind of happen? I haven't I haven't actually been there, but I've but I've heard about it at extensive length. Okay. Um, <laughs> from yeah, that that's where the dreams came from. The extent extent <laughs> I'm learning about the process of, of mold making. Um, but I mean, really, literally, it's it's. You know, they take the digital thing and they, they tell a little tiny little drill bit, um, make this in reverse in a giant chunk of aluminum. Right. And then it, they hit go. <laughs> and then three days later, your reverse miniature is now in a chunk of aluminum. It's not quite that simple. There's, there's multiple bit sizes and they have to go check it in and 
they break bits and all that other fun stuff. But, but then you just have this chunk of aluminum, which, which is, uh, um, half the model and they do it against the other half and they fit together at extreme high pressure. And then they inject plastic, hot plastic in an extreme high pressure and Mm -hmm. wait, uh, 45 to a, seconds to a minute and it pops out and good to go. Got plastic. Wow. 45 seconds. So you're pretty much fast. cranking them out. Yeah. Once you get the, now to these, I, I know we've all heard the stories of that. The, the rubber uh, metal molds are very, you know, they don't last long, right? They, they break down over, over course of several months or a year, depending on how much you use them for or two years. Um, do do you, the, do the, is it true that the metal molds for the plastics last much longer? Yeah, definitely. We, um, just to give you an idea when we would put out any miniature, Mm-hmm. Off of that, we would make five molds, just five production molds, because we knew they would be breaking down. If you sw- switch between them, they last a little longer. Right. So, you know, and we knew that we would probably go through those five molds for just the initial uh, run, where plastic is, um, or sorry, the aluminum molds, they pretty much, they, they guaranteed us that it would be 100,000 pressings at wow. minimum. If it was less than that, it would... They would fix it for free. So, okay. so I mean, compared to you know one or two thousand per per plastic mold, right? Mm. Uh, it's confusing. Metal molds for plastic and plastic molds for metal. <laughs> right. For for, for m- making metal miniatures, yeah, it, much much less, and you yeah, just have to remake that mold over and over again. Now, the other thing I've I've heard, Tal, and this may have been several years ago, and it may have changed now, is one of the challenges of plastics was that the initial creation cost of the metal molds was much higher. Than the creation cost for the rubber molds to make the metal. You're right. This is confusing to say. <laughs> so, but the initial cost was was higher because you're 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 etching into aluminum. Does the the computer manufacturing now and all the automation of that is that lowered that cost some or is that still really a is that upfront investment still much higher than it is for for the for what used to be the metal making process? It, yeah, it's definitely up, up front is is significantly higher and it really you know it you know it's one of those things where. You know, two years ago when we first started looking into it, we we're like, "Well, it it doesn't really make sense. We're not at that that place yet." Right. Um, but yeah, just just due to the the growth of Malifaux, we, you know, we we're like, "Oh, it now makes sense. <laughs> it has shifted." <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, do you think that'll mean though? Those there'll always be a place for like you know maybe smaller limited edition models will still probably be metals because it just doesn't the economy of scale doesn't really work for them. Is that sort of how it's going to work? You think? Or? To some degree, you you would think that, but. Once you have like this whole process in place, it, it almost feels like reinvent, reinventing the wheel to go back. <laughs> oh, so we, I see. Okay, you you know almost and, and you know you you even saw at Gen Con we had our Santana model and our Miss Mysterious model and mm-hmm. you know we yeah we didn't put out a whole ton of those and they were all in plastic just because it just sort of got wrapped into the whole production process and you know just just once you're going it you just sort of have this sort of constant overhead and just models pop out and you. <laughs> Right now, uh, the for instance, the mysterious and uh, and the other one that are that are limited edition. Are you what happens to those molds? Do they go up on a shelf and then someday you're gonna you make them again? Or like, I'm intrigued. Do, is I, there a is there a warehouse somewhere with all the limited edition molds that's ever been made by every company? I have to imagine there is. I haven't actually, like I said, I haven't been there. But you yeah, know, these. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've ever held. I mean, the blocks of aluminum are small. They're only you know, four inches by six inches or something like uh-huh. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. 70 pounds. Gee, should you try to pick one of these things up? Um, not quite that much, but they're exceedingly heavy. So there must wow. be a warehouse that's slowly sinking into the ground. Filled with, <laughs> with metal molds. <laughs> you know, molds from all our miniatures. Oh, that's funny. Um, now let me ask you this. Since so you've been working with the plastics for a while, are, is there, and we talked about, how you, the models, be, you know, one of the design considerations when you're, when you're working on the sculpt or the, I guess the concepts of the models is, is, you know, how are they going to cut it up? But do you feel more, um, I don't know if liberated is the white word, but is it more freeform design when you're, when someone's drawing up a new model concept with plastic or do you feel like there's certain limits like in the initial design process based on the, the final material, is it impacted like, well, can we, can we do bigger wings than now that it's plastic or do we have to keep them smaller? Can we do a, as fine of a bit as, not, uh, you know, as small of a tail as we can, right. we could with metals. What are some of those issues you found between more the like two different the mediums? stances of the models. Yeah. Can are, they, is any of that dynamic? impacted? Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's actually, it's a big pro, It's a big challenge. Um, it's, it's, the answer is both no and, and then yes. Huh. Um, that, I mean, originally, I mean, I think everyone's probably first experience with, uh, 
plastic miniatures was those second edition Warhammer <laughs> Battle Orcs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one pose. Right. You know, pretty much you never want to step on it because it would puncture you through your foot. Um, <laughs> And, and then you, you guys got used to it. People were like, oh, you can't do too much with plastics because, you know, it's two pieces of metal coming together. There's no dynamic mm-hmm. you can do with it. And then there was the advent of plastic glue, which is amazing. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And so then once you sort of bring them up and you can, you can really get dynamic um, because this glue just bonds it so tightly um, and, and the parts are just so light that you can have big wings that, that don't knock your model over instantly and snap off and and fall off the table and, and stuff like mm-hmm. that so there's there's a ton you can do once you start sort of thinking outside that that games workshop first orc sort of mold right like it has to be one piece outside the mold uh, i see what you did there i see what you did there. <laughs> uh, but yes yeah, so, so so once you start thinking about it yeah you can you can really get dynamic and and uh, I was I just carried around the Yamaziko model from that we put out at Gen Con because yeah. it just made me because I'm like we can't do this in plastic too well or in sorry in metal too well but uh-huh. uh, came together nicely in plastic and and you know like the spear she has stays straight whereas I don't know if you have played oh, with yeah. like metal swords they don't stay straight for long and then when you try and straighten them out they get worse and the paint chips right. off and right right <laughs> um, stick you. So you, so you're, so is it fair to say then you think the plastics in the end are, are more liberating once, once you sort of, from a design point of view is sort of what you can do once you get past sort of the initial challenges of how do you slice things up and, and stuff? It really, it is. Um, once you, once you get past that learning curve of what you can do that, you know, we, we just chuckle when we think about, uh, trying to start sort of redoing avatars down the road in plastics because they're going to be, um, in a way we could just couldn't do it metal. And, and, and let me ask you this too, because you see a lot of companies when they switch over to the plastics, um, immediately their box sets, they, they switch from, um, you know, an individual box for each variant of a particular model to a single box with all the variants on an extra sprue, right? Um, I'm thinking of the GW vehicles and the privateer press war jacks where now there's, you know, there's three different jacks in a box and you just pick which weapon you're going to put on it kind of thing. Is that because it's just easier to fill those sprues out. Or do you see that something weird would do, or is that just, I mean, why do you, is it even, I mean, do you, do you just do it to do it, or is it actually something that plastic lends itself to do? Does that question make sense? I think it comes down to the fact that each individual, you know, once you do the upfront cost, which mm-hmm. is scary and big, each individual pressing is, is, uh, is cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, quite a bit cheaper because, you know, basically, basically the mold making process is the same cost, but you just don't have to pay for the metal. Right. Um, so, so, yeah. So once you once you make this mold, you're like, well, we want to make this mold as versatile as we possibly can. So you, so yeah, you you make one you make one thing. I mean, it's I think it's probably why you saw one Rhino chassis. I go back to Games Workshop for so right. long um, that all the different tanks were you know, and it took a long time for them to update because uh, you know sprues that size are are extraordinarily expensive. Right. Um, so yeah, you really want to make it sit down and make it as versatile as possible. Um, and yeah, but uh, but at the same time, it gives you a lot of options because you're like, well, while I'm making it as versatile as possible. Why don't we give people like multiple different arm choices so they're all their miniatures can be personalized? Um, so yeah, it's a double it's a double edged sword. Or maybe I don't know. One of those was good. And one of them seemed bad. But <laughs> I get it. That's great. <laughs> but maybe it's a it's a sword to Twinkie. It's, it's a double edged <laughs> plastic spear. Hey. Well, you just you just piqued my interest too. Now, so you said the larger the sprue, the more expensive. So basically the more aluminum that has to be used yeah, to make the mold. Is that, is that where the money actually goes? So if you're, if you're going for a very large sprue for like maybe one of those big vehicle sprues GW does, you're going to, it's going to be much more expensive than a, than a, than several smaller sprues. It's actually, it's actually funny because it comes down not to material costs okay. when you're doing, it. it comes down to machine time. Ah. Because when these machines are cutting, cutting through the aluminum. You're talking about a million dollar machine and you need three days of it. Oh. So you start sort of prorating that out over the year and you need multiple people operating it. And so it's really just machining time, which, which turns into the big cost. Mm-hmm. And again, like you guys laughed at, laughed about it when I said it, you know, it sits there drying or cooling for a minute. Yeah. Um, that, that's actually when you, when you just say a minute on a two million, ten million $10 million machine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, that's that's literally. I mean, we we had a chat because you know the prices were were fluctuating when we were learning this process, and we had a chat. We're like, why why you know the price adjust? Because and then we literally heard because there was an extra forty five seconds of because your your model's chunky, right? Um, there's an extra forty five seconds of of cooling time, and that just adds to the cost of your miniature. So 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 really, you're t- you know a lot of the costs just come down to machining time. Oh, that's really interesting. So, so when you're designing a, and let me ask you this, just as a very creative person, obviously, you know, I know you, you, you're an artist, you come from that artist background and, and weird's very into their imagery. Um, do you guys conscientiously sit down when you're designing something and say, you know, back when the metal models, this is going to use too much metal. So it's, it's going to be too expensive or, or is it now with plastics that pose, that particular pose, that particular configuration is going to use too much machine time because it is too chunky. Does that enter your heads or is it pretty much just let your mind flow and then see what we can do at the end? Or how do you guys approach that issue? It all, it, it really does have to factor into it. Um, yeah, there's a ton of time where, I mean, when, you know, the artist would come back with a great piece of art and I'd be like, there's no way we could ever <laughs> turn that. Into. It's going to cost $85. Um, and then we get sad and then we go back to the drawing board. <laughs> <laughs> just a little, um, <laughs> but it's the same way. I mean, it's just, it's just a whole different set of, you know, when you, view art for the first time now there's just a whole different sort of mental checklist you go down um to see if it'll work right right so that, that's really interesting and that the um oh the other one i want to ask you about so there's the um the metal oh i just lost my question about the craig you got one real quick i gotta rethink my question uh, mike well i think that this i think this question is very relatively easy eric but i'm going to ask <laughs> it anyway uh, so I'm I'm getting the sense that from now on, um, all of the models that are going to be coming out of Weird are in plastic. Um, that's the goal. It yeah. really, um, you know, it was our goal from the start when we started. You know, when we, when you say okay, we're going to re- reinvent the wheel, I think yeah. you're like, oh, we, we we're going to want to stick with this new wheel. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know, at the same time, we didn't want to. We didn't want to. You know, if you notice my interviews at Gen Con, my interviews pre-Gen Con, I was like, you know, everyone was like, oh, are you going to, is everything going to go to plastic? And inside my head, I was like, if you guys like it, <laughs> <laughs> obviously put out plastics and everyone's like, no, we really actually do hate plastic. We'd be uh, like, oh, yes, we have to, but, um, but that's just not the case. I think once, you know, we went to, we did everything we could to make sure people liked uh-huh. it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's there'll be some bumps in the road, but I think it's being well received. Um, so. Has feedback been great so far? It's I mean, I, I've been impressed. I know we've we've talked on the show a little bit before about um, some of the you know we're coming to grips with the assembly challenges. That weird weird models have always been extremely detailed, so it's it's you know you have to be kind of a, a good model either way. But but um, they look fantastic. I mean, has generally reception been very positive in your forums and, and online? Yeah, it seems to be so far. I mean, obviously obviously there are there are people who hate it and there are people who love. <laughs> And right. everyone in between, but, but yeah, I, I think in general, um, um, it's been a very, very, I mean, we, we've seen a lot more people who say, I always hated plastic, but I'm going to try this because it looks great right, versus right. people who were like, I was going to give it a shot, but now it's crappy. So I don't like it. Uh, well, you know, I think it's pretty hard. I, I mean, every company's, you know, using the plastic and I think you're, and that, that reminded me of a question I wanted to ask that I, I forgot, which was you gave us that really illustrative example of the $8 cost of Lord Chompy bits going up to 24. What is, and, and you, you know, you, you, you gave good feeling for the, the fact that these molds are very expensive and the, and the machining time is expensive. Once you've got that mold built though, what is the, like, can you give us a ballpark figure of like the per injection cost? Is it, is it, is there a lot of money still in, 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 in injecting each mold and cranking out the plastic sprues or is that point a pretty, pretty low cost? Um, it's definitely lower cost. I can't give you specific numbers because it really varies sure. widely. Um, I mean, obviously, if you look at um, different models, some of them are big and chunky and crazy, and you see other sprues that's really thin because you know there is actually a plastic cost involved. Right. But yeah, the, the the actual per per miniature cost is is reduced. Um, so so yeah, I mean, like I said, there's a there's a tipping point where you, after you prorate out all the mold costs, you're gonna you're, you start coming out ahead after X amount of. Uh, X amount of miniatures out the door. Right. So, so really though, it sounds like the, most of the cost concerns when you're doing design is around the the machining time and the, and the cooling time as opposed to what the plastic cost will be. Is that yeah, fair to say? That's also what, you know, ultimately you're like, oh, that's kind of scary and, and, and unknown. But ultimately that's not a big, like, 
that machine is going to be working for us for the next 10 years. Um, the cost of the machine, the cost to operate the machine doesn't change dramatically. Like, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe plastic costs will quintuple, but since plastic is such a minor part of the overall cost, right. um, sort of insulates our price against major changes. Um, you know, that's not to say that there aren't, won't be, you know, labor costs go up, you know, there's a, tons of factors, but overall the actual cost feels to us like we're not going to have to revisit it for a while. Um, unlike metal where we really had to look at it every year. Cool. Okay. Um, um go ahead, Greg. I'm going to go back to my little thing again, cause I'm just curious. So I'm, I, I would assume then there's a, there's sort of a timeline or a, not that you'll tell us and not that you should, but just to know there's, um, uh, like a structure that you guys are putting in place to slowly transition existing models into plastic as well. Um, we definitely have a plan, and the plan is so top secret. I can't even mention that we have a plan. Uh, <laughs> there, the, say no more. We know nothing there of this is, plan. There is no of which plan you speak. for the plan, right? <laughs> there's no plan here today. <laughs> Got it. Uh, no, it's, yeah, we, we we're looking into it. It's not yeah. it's not terribly a secret. Once I start talking about, um, and it's just you know, obviously everyone likes new things, new sculpts of their master and their important miniatures. So right, we're looking into it and. Um, now, would you go with a with a transition like just with the same design, or would you go with like you say alternate sculpts? Oh, okay. or is that part of the dastardly plan? <laughs> have I ever just dialed it in and, and redone something the same? It's an excellent point. It's a good point. I shouldn't have even asked it. I apologize. You deserve my best, <laughs> Eric, and that was that was not good enough. And I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So, um, so yeah, and, and as is we're looking at the option too. I mean, I'm sure your answer is going to be yes, but I'm going to ask it anyway because you know they, I'll get emails if I don't. Um, so basically, are you looking at the idea of having? You know, Craig pointed out that if you were to redo them in plastics, obviously you'd probably do alt sculpts just to make things interesting. But but are you also looking at the idea of of uh, different options for particular models, like the thing I alluded to earlier? Or is that I know Malifaux is not really designed for that at the moment, but it you know, could be or different variants in the same box. I mean, if you look at uh, just the stuff that came out of Gen Con, every, lots of things had multiple arm oh, options. I didn't even think about yeah, it. You're yeah, right. Yeah, You're right. Actually, I didn't even catch that. You're right. I, well, I only got Mysterious as the new plastics. Craig got all of the, the other new hotness. So I, I did. I did. I didn't check out that. I should have. I and I And I looked at all the options, and I went, oh, I got to go with the box. And I went with the box <laughs> on all. Where's your sense of adventure? Wait, Come on. I want the guy Wait, flipping the coin on the back of his hand, <laughs> and I want the guy with the big giant piece of chunk of wood. And yeah. yeah well, so. The, I, yeah, I, I the chunk of wood is pretty much a no brainer. That's that's yeah. my. Uh, that's what I thought. <laughs> I made the guy like seven times, and every time I look at him, and I'm like, yeah, I still gotta go with the chunk of wood. <laughs> so Eric, I have to ask you about the new. Um, well, I got you. I don't know if this is related to the to the new uh, weird plastics initiative, but you had at Gen Con, you showed off those new translucent colored plastic bases. We didn't show them off. We, they're that's when they hit the market. Well, I know what I mean. You were selling them, and, and you sent us some samples to give away on the show, which is awesome. Thank you very much. And they look great. I was looking at them really closely. So, are those are those something you guys are manufacturing yourselves? Is that it is? And, and if so, what's the you know? Because most of us, um, you know, glue our models to our bases and prime the models on the bases. So, what's the approach to the clear bases? What's the thinking there? Well, here's the thinking. Um, a, they they're kind of neat. They look cool. Like if you put if yeah. you put like a one of our base toppers on them. Um, you just have the, you end up with like this kind of neat ring of color around your model that really differentiates it and makes it stand out. Yeah. Um, it actually kind of goes, I, I like it because it goes back to like, I don't know, like my Starcraft days where you select something and there's they like they glow. Ring. Oh, I get it. That, okay. Yep. <laughs> that, you know, that, that, that's the geek in me. That's the, the, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago sitting up late at night playing Starcraft and, and memory coming up and warm feelings and things like that. Right. Um, but more than that. Um, and this is something that you probably won't have heard anywhere else is Ooh. that we are working on all our base toppers coming in plastic too. So oh, they will literally uh, just get in there. So you can, you can, you can glue your model to the base topper. Nah, I get it. All right. <laughs> That's see there. I was trying to figure out yeah. how to do this. Now I get it. The I'm clever plan some issues with my plastic guys and my see, resin bases. There are clever master plans going on over there. He's not telling us oh, about. Well, he just told no us about doubt. that one. I had no doubt. There I was had no clever doubt. plans galore. That's awesome. So it's kind of cool though because now you could go with. I, I think what's also neat about this now I could make my, you know, my guild crew be the purple translucent base crew and, and someone else might do the red ones and that way my models stand out more too which is pretty slick I think they look great they look really cool I was just trying to figure out how to make it work and still not paint over my base so now I know 
there, there is that. And, and, uh, and yeah, there was, there was that missing link that, uh, yeah. been released or talked about yet. Very cool. That's neat. They look very cool. So that's great. So, and is that part of the same, I mean, are you using the same manufacturer to crank that stuff out or is it just a happy coincidence that came out at the same time as the plastics? Manufacturer. Oh, cool. Okay. That makes oh, sense. Great. Cool. So this is a little side benefit. Can you, um, can you give a couple examples before we're out of time here? So, some examples of some of your favorite things you were able to do now that you guys have done plastics? Is there, was there a particular sculpt or whatever you're most proud of that, you know, this is really something we could never have done in metals? Well, I already hit on, on the Yamaziko thing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I don't know if you saw me, but pretty much the entire Gen Con, I was running around with a smile and like bending over <laughs> her ear, watching it sort of twang back, back in <laughs> alignment and, and, uh, people with it and just sort of having fun with this, this sort of miniature bit that you could never do in metal without, uh, having a, permanently bent out of shape thing. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, it, you, you really can get finer with finer detail and not have to worry about, um, that detail kind of getting screwed up. And that's another thing that I, I really haven't hit on in metal. Um, literally when you get metal from the metal manufacturer, you get a giant box with, with a thousand miniatures all shoved in it. Oh, wow. Um, which is why when you look at a metal miniature, you might be like, hmm, there are some, you know, this ridge has a little d- nick in it. And that's because its end was jammed into the, that ridge. And, um, and you, just don't, you just don't get that with plastics. I mean, they stack nicely. They fit. They, mm. uh, nothing's rubbing against one another. So you, you get fine detail, and your fine detail stays nice and fine without, uh, throughout now, the whole process. Let me ask you this. As part of the process, so when you're doing boxing and stuff, I'd imagine when they send you the metals, back or whatever are they at least sorted or do you get do you get a giant i mean are they sorted by type at least so you can kind of parse them out or are they all just in a big jumble and it's thing you have to worry about with plastics um well here's the thing ideally they're not in a big jumble <laughs> but <laughs> right. they, um and then sometimes you have people who just hate life for about three days sorting them out <laughs> oh yeah right <laughs> that is another pitfall that you get to avoid with plastics yeah. right right that sounds good. happy employees oh let me ask you this too have you found that um the error rate is lower on plastics, uh, you know, because I know sp- something will fall off your plastic sprue. But overall, yeah, I mean, you don't have to rely on people being like, okay, put, put one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these, and one of those in this right. box. Um, you just throw one sprue and you're good to go. Yeah. Is it, is it true of the casting process as well? Is it, does it generally feel like that casts are more reliable on plastics or, or you know, because I know the metals, when you spin them, sometimes it doesn't fill all the way in and you got to redo it or whatever. Yeah, because like I said, again, it's, you know, it relies on spinning to get all the bubbles out. Mm-hmm. Whereas with this plastic, it relies on extraordinarily high, hot pressure, yeah. um, which seems to do the trick. And, you know, that's, that's one of the, that's one of the big problems with resin going back to that is that again, you're just spinning it and resin likes to hold on to bubbles even better than metal does. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, so yeah, you, you get to avoid that with plastics largely there. I mean, there are, there are some other pitfalls, but, but, uh, but yes, smaller Great. rings. Now, one thing I think Craig was talking about last episode, and I want yes. to bring this up too, is is um, it feels like to me it's it's trickier sometimes. I mean, have you guys looked at the issue of assembly instru- assembly instructions being included in the plastics? Do you think like I've been getting feedback that people have a harder time figuring out how to put the guys together? I was going to try to be a little gentler about well, this I'm question. Just, but... just throwing it out there, you know, people are going to email me if I don't ask these kind of hard hitting, that's very journalistic true. questions. You know, I just have to go there. Um, no, but have you, have you given me getting that kind of feedback, Eric, or have you guys put, you know, has, or has it been as much feedback or is it about the same as you get from metals? People get confused. I mean, we will never get more feedback than the, why the heck is uh, sword Victoria's hand so small and why'd you cut it there? Um, <laughs> right. And if you've ever played with that, model, you've probably glued her hands back on 75 times. Um, uh, I've so only yeah. glued that hand on twice. I would like to, I would like to point out. Very kind with your <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's about the same. Um, the biggest thing that we've had that we've had to deal with is that, um, if you if you look at the sprue, sometimes it's like, oh, you know, you have a four four, four inch by six inch size, and that's our standard size mm-hmm. for our bigger sprues. So stuff pieces kind of get puzzled in, so you, and we sort of puzzle in as many pieces as possible. So the pieces for the same miniature don't always sit right next to one another. Mm, right, um, and that was the biggest complaint, um, and one we had to really kind of uh, look into in more depth, and we're we're looking at finding like color-coded maps of the sprue which let you know which miniature is what and if you look at our sprues they also are number like a model will have a number code um 
so that's that's the biggest complaint. The actual putting it together, I mean, I think typically I've just been like, try try plastic loot, and people are like, oh, that solved it all. <laughs> yeah, um, because of stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 about on par, um, and we're we're dealing with it best we can, and and mm. it's just similar to how we questions. I think now, they're fantastic. Um, Go ahead, Greg. Well, I was just gonna say to 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 piggyback on that because I. I've been building models for a while, and I, I was cranking out the plastics on. Metal Gammons figured them out. Uh, Rail Gollum figured it out. Uh, Yamazuki loved her, figured it out. Um, and then when I got to the Ten Thunder Archers, I, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I literally, the, the head cloths, I tried twice for like a half hour at a time. And I don't know if like I'm just old and my hands are shaky now, or I didn't know which ones to fit together. And to be to be blunt, uh, what I ended up doing was I actually green stuffed my own little neck cloths on there, which worked fine. And I mean, the rest of the models are awesome. The poses are incredible, and I, I just I love them. But I just couldn't figure out, and that they're so tiny. And I, I just all I wanted was some instructions, but I don't even know if instructions would have helped. Like, am I alone, Eric? Am I the only one who's had that I think, problem? I, I I honestly like have to admit that if you looked closely at the the examples we had in the booth, they had no head cloth. Um, that's, that's, that's what we like to call expert assembly techniques. Um, that, that, yeah, I feel se- better already. And, uh, and, you know, optional pieces, optional bits. Uh, right, it's optional. Once you, once, you stick, once you stick that head on, you're like, a cloth's never going in there. Um, well, the only problem with that is they've got giant chunks out of the back of their head where theoretically, I guess, the head, the, the neck cloth's supposed to slot in. But I just couldn't figure it out for the life of me. But uh, I'll, I'm here to say that that green stuff worked a charm. And I, and I, and I did weigh, like, do, am I just going to leave it? Because you're absolutely right. You can leave it out because once the hat's on, you can't really see those pieces missing. But the models, the... the, the um, the uh, the graphics on the box that show you the way they look with the neck cloths are they're they're just too cool to let go, so it was an easy yeah. fix. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like having some sort of strange early senior moment. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, I just with that one, I stick the head cloth on before you stick the head on, um, and you can make it work. Uh, that was the only thing I came up with. <laughs> There's but, a yeah, that's to- a bit more advanced than, than things you've yes. seen in the past. Gotcha. Good. Okay. Good. Cool. Well. Well, Eric. Th- oh, go ahead, Eric. Trying to with that one. It's tough. Yeah, but and, and, but that's you know, and and I've said it before on the show. I think your your models are so detailed that um, you know, there's options there to do some really cool stuff. But it definitely helps to have some experience because there's just some crazy cool, crazy cool stuff there in the in the weird yeah. stables. So you got to you got to be careful to get the most out of them. But, yeah, but that, I mean, that they we've always said exactly what Russ just said that they're they're not for beginner people. But that's what blew me away. I mean, you know, because. Uh, not to gush too much, but when I got uh, mysterious, the when I looked at the coffin, um, the detail on just the grains of the woods and everything that came with it, I was looking very closely because I, I know my death marshals very well, and I'm like, she looks. I mean, the grain and the detail on her coffin was actually better than on the metals, and I was really impressed by that. And the subtle, yeah. you know, the subtle, um, the subtle shapes in her in her clothing and everything looks. The, the models look fantastic. They really do, and they definitely reward the extra bit of time for assembly. But they, you guys, really did a fantastic job, Eric, and the plastics look really wonderful. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the sculpting process, the fact that you can zoom in you know, on right. a computer where you can mm. zoom in when you're sculpting lets you add a lot more detail. And it's just a matter of whether the plastic, you know, whether the, the actual cutting machine can find detail. Can get that in there. Well, it looks great. Yeah. Right. Well, Eric, thank you so much for taking some time out and telling us all about the uh, the ins and outs of plastic manufacturing. Hopefully, everybody learned something there today. I know I did I for sure. I think, yeah, I think it's something everybody thinks they know a little bit about, but I learned a lot more today than I thought I was gonna, which is awesome. There you go. Hopefully, it will keep, prevent many, many people from wanting to invent that wheel because <laughs> 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 it's not that fun. No, I, I, I can only imagine. Words of wisdom. And, but thanks for you. Thanks to you for doing it, though. Right. We appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was too dumb to know I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> See, ninety-nine percent of entrepreneurs comes from ignorance. That's what I say. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Right. Success comes Success, from ignorance. Success. Exactly. Or actually, even the attempt. Right. Exactly. Something like that. Something very profound that I didn't say. Anyway, That's what we want. Okay. To go. I said we call it quits <laughs> now. Are you looking for news, reviews, and interviews? The D Six Generation. 
It's groovy is, it's groovy does defy, baby. The D6 generation, born to game. Oh, yeah. And now we'd like to welcome our newest sponsor to the show, ArmorCast. Yeah, buddy. ArmorCast. Now, as in the fine traditions of all of our other sponsors, these are guys that we used long before they were sponsors. If you guys remember, all of my dust terrain Mm -hmm. is ArmorCast. Paid for every penny. I love it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love it. Everybody's aghast. It's just beautiful ruined resin brick buildings that I just could not buy enough of at Adepticon. Right. And uh, so these, the, the, you go to their website, uh, armorcast.com, mm-hmm. and you will see all kinds of different cool options for very affordable resin scenery for all kinds of different board game or for war games, tabletop war games at different scales. Just really, really cool stuff. Do you know what's cooler than the scenery, though, Craig? What is cooler? Th- I would not say cooler than their oh, scenery, Russ, but cooler. what is equally as cool as their scenery? You know, they make fantastic scenery. A lot of folks make great scenery, and Armorcast scenery is, is up there with some of the best on the planet. However, what I think is really unique to Armorcast, and really they're the, one of the only companies that do it, is what they call their cinematic effects. They are now, awesome. These are so cool. Basically, they've got pre-sculpted for you all kinds of crazy things to shoot out of your gun. You yep. want your gun to be having a, a barrel, a and muzzle. And by gun, fl- we mean your miniatures gun. Yes. Uh, you want some muzzle flash? <laughs> They've got different kinds of ex- size of explosions for that. You want a missile shooting out with a smoke con- smoke trail behind it coming out of the launcher? They've got or that. Or flames coming out of a flamer, right. or acid and bile coming out, or my personal favorite, the hamster missile. Exactly. You want back backwash coming out of the back of your missile launcher? All that's there. they got all that stuff. You can kick your miniatures up to notches that are unbelievable. And what is really fun about this right now is they're actually holding their second annual Cinematic Effects Contest right now at ArmorCast. And the best place to go check it out is their ArmorCast Facebook page. So if you go to Facebook and you search for ArmorCast, you will find it. And right there they have all the rules for the contest. And you can win cool ArmorCast loot as well as show off your awesome modeling prowess. And if you always want to have a great excuse to have your Imperial Guard Sentinels Flamer actually shooting flame out of the front of it or any other cool awesomeness, just check out ArmorCast.com for all that great stuff. Remember, head over to ArmorCast.com and check out all their scenery, their cinematic effects, and so, so much more. And the and the, the pictures from the last year's cinematic effects contest are awesome, like cannons that are, the lighting effects have been painted onto the models and all kinds of cool stuff. So definitely go ahead and go on over and check it out. and Let them know that you heard about them from us. That is an important element of this whole symbiotic relationship. It's the circle of life, people. It is the circle, circle, it is of, the life. circle of life. Let them know the D6G sent you when you visit ArmorCast.com. This is Total Fangirl. Regular Jane most days, Total Fangirl when the moment strikes. Han shot first. Starbucks is a guy. And Lestat now there's a vampire. Hey everyone, this is Nicole, your Total Fangirl. You can follow me on Twitter at Nicole Wakeland or check out my blog, TotalFangirl.com. This week's shout out. I respect you, boss. I don't really want to whack you. It's just business, you know? It's nothing personal. Coming soon to Kickstarter.com. I have just gotten back from a very quick trip to Los Angeles for something very unexpected. I had the privilege of going out to Activision to check out the new Skylanders Giants game. Those of you with kids probably remember playing this um, nonstop last year when it came around around the holidays. Um, It's a game for, you know, Xbox and for Wii and you have these little collectible characters and you put them on the portal of power and they show up on your screen and you battle to save Skyland. And they've come out with a new version version called Skylanders Giants, which are, you know, giants. The characters are about twice the size of the ones that you remember. So you have those. You also have some that light up. They're called light core, and they actually have sort of clear bits in different colors that light up when you put them on the portal of power. And then they have some new and returning regular sized figures, like a series two that the kids can play with. We got to go to Activision, which let me just tell you, heading out there, that is a cool office. They have all sorts of unbelievable awards for all of the games that they've made over the years. And everything everywhere is just video games. There's stuff in the elevator, there's posters, in the hallways, there's posters. There's a giant thing counting down the hours at the moment until Skylanders Giants actually comes out. And they took us into this conference room where they had 
every conceivable product tie-in that they're doing for the game. And you can see that they got it, that the game is popular and that the kids like it. Because if there's something you want with Skylanders on it, you're going to be able to buy it. There's books, there's bags, there's bicycles, there's clothing, there was calendars. One that We went home with a calendar, which was cool, and a t-shirt that the girls thought was the best thing ever. But the fun thing about all this, aside from getting to go to L.A. for the weekend, was the reaction of the kids. It was for bloggers and their children. They were encouraging us to bring our kids, so I brought both of the girls. And when we got into this conference room and they fed us pizza and they fed us salads and lots of soda, so the kids were all sugared and pizzaed up. And the people who made the game started asking what the kids liked about the first one and what they wanted to have in the second one. And at first, the kids were all really quiet because here you are at this gigantic conference table and, you know, you got your pizza, but still conference table, not an environment where kids are, you know, comfortable. But the guys were really laid back and everyone was, you know, chatting about their favorite characters. And before you know it, the only people talking in the room are the kids and the designers for the game. The parents and sort of like the marketing PR people were all just kind of sitting back and watching because they were having this fascinating conversation where the kids know every in and out of every single character and who did this and how many levels they get to. And they are asking these designers questions that have such details that like a hard hitting investigative reporter would have been proud. You know, are you going to do this? Are you going to have them go to level 10? Or are you going to have them go higher? They're going to go higher. They're going to go to level 15. Are you going to bring this character back? Yeah we're going to bring them back. I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to get more hats. The designers were almost laughing because it was so funny. The kids were so into it. And there was a point where you lost the kidness of the children and the adultness of the designers. So they were suddenly just having this wonderful, enthusiastic, geeky, nerdy conversation about a game that everybody loved. It was a really fun moment to see these people who are absolute and utter professionals suddenly squeeing about the game they made with a bunch of kids who were just as excited, if not more so than they were. And then the kids got some hands-on time with the game. They played for about 45 minutes. And again, it was great because the kids are playing. The parents are kind of watching and trying to sort of get in there. Good luck to us. And the designer's like, what do you think about him? Oh, try this combination. Put this one on. It was all about the two of them. So instead of having us all being addressed as bloggers and writers and reviewers, it was really all about the kids and the best part of the experience was just seeing that enthusiasm that everybody had for the game. It looks like it's going to be really fun. If your kids played Skylanders the first time around or played, um, if you played Skylanders, because you know, grownups too, uh, definitely go out and get your hands on this game. They're also trying really, really hard to not have the supply issues they had last time. I know everybody thinks it was a big ploy to sell more, but they didn't really run, want to run out of it. I think they said they just completely underestimated just how well received and how popular it would be. So they're trying very, very hard to not have this happen and have everybody be able to get the characters that they want. It actually comes out on October 21st. So those of you planning for the holidays, start getting your pennies together. There's going to be a, a new version that you can get if you've never played before that includes a little portal of power, or you can sort of get the add-on that doesn't have that, and it's a little bit less uh, if you had the original game. So check it out. Skylanders Giants with all new figures. Uh, and if the designer's enthusiasm and excitement was any indication about what your kids are going to think, they're going to love it. Hey, Craig. Uh-huh. <coughs> what? <coughs> what? Craig, do you know who's been bringing the war to your door since 1999? Well, I think Vic is at my door right now. He is. Vic from the War Store is bringing Vic us awesome Viking. gaming. And make sure you go to thewarstore.com, not warstore.com, because you get some yeah, you crazy don't buy any bag. purses. Yeah, right. I don't know what that's about. I want bags of war-causing stuff. <laughs> and uh, you know what's coming up? Let's say you wanted to see the War Store in action, you know? And oh, yeah. let's say you lived in, in the greater... glory, if let's, you will. Let's say you lived in the greater New York area, you know, New Jersey... New York, that whole area. And let's say you got nothing going on in October, and you're thinking, I want to go do something fun. I'm a gamer, right? I wish there was a con in my area in October because I got nothing going on. Well, good news, <clears throat> excuse me, the War Store Weekend is right around the corner. Yep. It is. Craig, what's the website for the War Store Weekend? Uh, the website for the War Store Weekend would be War Store Weekend, the War Store Weekend dot com. I know, right? It's October 26th through 28th this year. Yep. And uh, they're going to be doing all kinds of fun stuff. There's tons and tons of miniature gaming, as you might imagine from folks at the War Store. Um, 
and uh, there's a great 40K GT going on. All kinds of fantastic stuff. So head over to the WarStoreWeekend.com. War Machine Hordes, Battlefleet oh, Gothic, you name 40K, it. That be a Beachhead, which is a game a game that Neil, the guy, the guy at mm-hmm. the War Store, actually runs. Yeah, this really cool do um, somewhere in the South Pacific. You do a, a, a you do an, a, an, an amphibious landing. Right. Uh, that just starts sounds awesome. Yeah, Flames of War is going to be there. How about Dream Pod Nine? All kinds of hotness. If you have a miniature game, it's going on there. And you know, even if you don't want to play. Go anyway because the War Store has a fantastic booth. These kind of things, which is about every modeling bit you'd ever want yeah, or it's need. So check it out. The War Store weekend this October twenty sixth through twenty eighth. You got to go. And it's uh, they've got their pre orders up for the Dystopian Legion stuff from Spartan Games too. Ooh, so good. you can pre order that. Nice, the hotness. Awesome. There you go. One simple thought this time around, just play. I've been talking with lots of folks during these past few weeks about how they determine what games they'll play. It struck me this past weekend while I was playing both finished games and prototypes. I don't care so much what I was playing, I just wanted to play. Most groups have a complex dynamic of balancing different player preferences. I'll play what Reginald wants this week so that Jeeves can play what he wants to next week. I'll acquiesce to Alfred's request for more abstract strategy games in order to convince him to play more deck-building games with me at another time. I'll join Jennings for a game of bridge only after he's played a round of Eclipse at my behest. And yes, in all these examples, I only play games with right and proper butlers. Players spend an inordinate amount of time and energy determining what to play, agonizing over how to allocate their precious gaming time. Players will use email threads, forums, text messages, calendars, and all manner of other methods to help coordinate their play. As I look at how much time goes into this process, I wonder if it would be better or more refreshing if I just showed up to play something and actually had people who would just play. They wouldn't waffle about what game they wanted to play or if they had time to play or this or that or the other thing and waste an hour trying to determine what to play when we could have played another game. In a way, it reminds me of the pure joy of playing games as a kid. We didn't have a lot of choices for games, so we played what we had, and we had fun with them. The joy of discovering a new game was that it was unknown. We had no predisposition and no opinions colored by researching the game online and considering the negative and positive conclusions drawn by reviewers. We just played. That's what I see when I wish upon a game. How about you? How much time do you spend in the administration and determination of what to play and how to play them? Think about how refreshing it would be to just play. Email me at wish at gamesalute.com and let me know how it turns out. Thanks for listening and have fun playing. And you know, I think I mentioned before, one of my favorite things about Game Salute is how they help young, starting out, kickstarting game companies, uh, you know, with all the basics. And one of their favorite ones they've just vetted, they're looking at it right now, and this one I'm very excited about, Craig. I mentioned this last episode mm. Story Realms. Looks oh, really yeah. Fun. This, it looks awesome. This Kickstarter is a RPG designed for the whole family. Uh, you can get in with younger kids, but also it looks like it's got plenty of meat for older folks. The artwork looks fantastic. It takes place in a world where all those fairy tale things are real. Um, so you can choose from your favorite kinds of fairy tale things. And it looks like it's got cool gaming aids, great ways to keep track of your character, very straightforward. Yeah. Um, and it's all about stories, it as is. you could guess from the, from it, the name. It is. It looks really, really wonderful, and it's a great... Uh, project, great, great example how you can use Kickstarter, you know, to, to, to kickstart one of these things. If you're looking for a way to play RPGs with your whole family, be sure to head over to kickstarter.com and search for Story Realms. It's right there. It looks fantastic. It's doing great with 15 days to go. Still rocking. This is the Dice Tower Network at dicetowernetwork.com. Well, welcome back. And now we're excited to talk about, uh, well, some, Two of, of, us are some of us are excited to talk about, about uh, a little segment we're calling Digital Diversions. Uh, so when I was talking to Eric uh, off the air last week, we were talking about what to talk about. Uh, you know, he, you, Eric, you'd mentioned that you were working on, or you've been playing a lot of these little, you know, iPhone games or whatever, just kind of between between all the hard work you guys do over there, right? Because you don't have any time to play anything else. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, you know, me too. So I think it'd be fun to kind of talk about some of these games that maybe appeal to us as gamers in general. 
and what are we playing? And not just necessarily on the portable devices, but also games we're playing on PCs. There's some really nice light games there too, as well as maybe sneaking on and playing a little heavier game once in a while, just kind of, you know, what, what we as, as miniature and board gamers also find neat about uh, digital games, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, let's see, uh, Eric, why don't you start off? What, so what's the, what's the hotness right now that's, that's taking up a lot of your time when you're, you know, well, waiting for a yeah, bus I mean, or something? I mentioned it earlier, but uh, this Blood Brothers game on uh, Android is actually actually just on uh, iPhone 2 now, which is good because the other half of the office can now play and, and uh, <laughs> now, get cr- crushed by my squad of familiars. So how does it work? Now describe the game for us who haven't tried it. it, it. I mean, it, it's, it's a role-playing game in, in the very loosest sense because there is no choice. You just sort of walk your way through it and it tells yep. you a story. But as you're walking your way through it, um, you get to collect these you're basically you're a vampire and so you kill things and then you're like oh look i didn't kill that one too bad i can bring it back to life and it can be my little minion and the more you the more you get the more the bigger stuff you can kill and the you know it's 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 that it's that i want them all sort of get your blood flowing Mm -hmm. but then but then you get to fight people and you know you're like ah finally my 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 obsession with collecting you know griffins has finally paid (laughs) off and i'm crushing my my employees at this game. So, 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 I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it's by no mean thoughts, thought provoking. And so, so we, we, sometimes we sit around the office and we're like, well, why are we still playing this game? And then we're like, but I'm going to go play it now. Um, and you know, it's one of those things where you're like, ah, I hate this game. And you look around and three of us are playing it as we're talking about how much we, we, we shouldn't be playing it. So, so there's something there. The, there's that, addictive. that yep. element of, of, Sort of, I gotta collect it and then crush people with what I just collected, um, which is really kind of viscerally satisfying. In a, in a way, you don't get to enjoy in society that often. Nice. So that's sort of that's sort of been the big one that uh, that we've been talking about. And and you know, there's so many games on 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 the phone that that are are just underwhelming in terms of production quality mm-hmm. and and uh, and that. And this one's you know the art's beautiful and the the gameplay is fast and simple and and so yeah i mean you can play it while you know i don't know doing a radio interview or a hosting <laughs> job not that you I are mean, right now you're totally devoted mm-hmm. to this, this episode right 100 you know? good um, okay. of my time is, is spent <laughs> playing this game uh, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> um so no yeah it, it's 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 good fun but it, it's really it's really quite brainless and, and it's literally something you can pull out of your pocket Blood Play Brothers. For 10 minutes now, what do they charge you? Is it is it free or is it like a buck or what do they charge for Blood Brothers? It, it's it's free, so you, you can download it and figure out why I'm crazy and why we're playing this game at all. Um, <laughs> but of course, there's 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 780 thousand different ways in which they tempt you to spend money. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. One of which is the joy of crushing your friends at it. I might add. Now, how do you? Which is which is a really alluring. So do, you, spend money. so do you build up your little your little force and then go challenge your friend to a duel and fight him, kind of like a Pokemon thing or something? Or yeah, well, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's kind of random. Yeah. So, so like, so you you're kind of playing, and then it says, "Oh, you get to fight someone," and you're like, "Oh, please be my friend." Oh, I see. Um, and then it's mostly mo- mostly not, but it is <laughs> it is satisfying to then get your friend and then yes. crush them when it comes up. But, well, that's cool. and there's actually more reasons. There's actually more times when you're actually working with your friends, so you know. Whatever. Nice. <laughs> Those aren't the fun times. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's cool. So, uh, well, so Blood Brothers. So check that out. So I'll I'll pick one next. I have. Yeah. Have uh, you I'll heard pick of one? Oh, go ahead, Craig. When I first got my smartphone, I decided I wanted a game, and I went through. And the number one game on the day I was looking was a game called Temple Run. Oh, did you like that one? Uh, no. 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 It was free, <laughs> and uh, it was neat because I had never played any of these games before. Yeah. So you're like, I'm like tilting my phone, and and it's basically you're like an over the shoulder shot of this Indiana Jones like guy who's mm-hmm. running away from a giant band of monkeys that are trying to kill him, <laughs> and uh, you're and just is- running <laughs> along these paths. It, what's that? Uh, what was I don't that? see how a giant band of monkeys can be bad. Yeah, how no, 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 be- that part's not bad. <laughs> It's right. just boring because okay. event. All you're doing is running and and you're <laughs> like running along and collecting these coins and you've got to jump over roots of trees and jump over holes in the in the pathway and that's pretty much it. Right. And uh, yeah, and I just kept constantly falling into the water or like I forget to jump and so I stop at the root and then the monkeys catch you and you know it's worth <laughs> a it's worth a chuckle for a few minutes and then um, 
And then I was just like, seriously, I look like an idiot in the in the physical therapy waiting room, like twisting my phone all over the place. And <laughs> so uh, so I stopped and I took it off my phone. But uh, yeah. that's the one and only thing I can actually add to this entire conversation. Oh, so I want to hear about continue, that. Continue, Russ. I want to hear about the Indiana Jones whip app. So keep that on your list. That's um, not a whip. It's seriously an actual <laughs> whip that I got for my birthday years ago. OK, um, now I have one. It's kind of like yours, Eric. It is. Look, but it's a whip and you press the button. And it goes like that. Oh, nice. Um, actually, is an Indiana Jones whip app for the <laughs> Unless phone. Unless you go though. like this. And then it goes like this. <laughs> I like the music. <laughs> okay. So nice. There it is. Thank you, Indy. Lest um, there be any confusion. So I like the, um, there's a game out there called One Million. And it's, if you want to search for it on iOS, I think it's also on Android. It's, it's, it's one with all the zeros after it. Um, and this game is basically a very simple and it, and kind of that Eric's point it's not a pretty game it's it's got that little retro 8 bit graphic style and basically on the top your little adventure just starts running through the dungeon okay and he's running along sort of a side scrolling little dungeon thing and he'll come to something like a door okay now when he gets to the door the bottom half of the screen is all one of those little slider puzzle deals so it's kind of like bejeweled you slide over a thing but all the items in there instead of different jewels are different objects so there's keys there's swords there's magic thing, magic wands, and if you line up three keys, that's great because the puzzle moves down and, and, it, and it removes those stones that shape like keys, and the puzzle slides down like bejeweled. But then also, if you're at a door, it unlocks the door, and then you run along a little more, and you'll get to a dragon. Well, now you got to start matching up the swords or the wands to get magic spells or sword hits on the dragon, and the faster you get those matches, so it's kind of like a a puzzle matching game, but it combines that with a dungeon crawler, um, and it's very very addictive. Even though the graphics are simple and it's just a little puzzle solver. Um, if you like that sort of thing, um, then you will like, if you like like Puzzle puzzle Quest and those kind of games, you will like this game as well. That's one million on the uh, on the iPhone. I believe it's also on Android. So, uh, Eric, do you have any other games you're playing? I do. There's one that, uh, it's a cute little game. It's uh, with very kind of fun, striking graphics and uh, an interesting play style, but it's called Cat Ball Eats It All. <laughs> I love the name. <laughs> There's a cat, which is actually a ball that, with a little cat face on it. And I guess, I guess to some degree, it's sort of like, I guess the best thing I can kind of uh, equate it to is, and this is just on iPhone and iPad, yeah. but uh, remember s- s- the very first Sonic the Hedgehog, the special levels where you're like spinning oh, yeah, yeah, and right. you're like cl- collecting gems and breaking through walls and things? Right. It's kind of like that, but but way better. <laughs> um, so so it's it's physics it's physics based, and you're a cat ball, and you're trying to eat everything like you do. And there's a dog wall. There's a dog wall that's <laughs> dog chasing you, so you're it's for, forcing you through through the level. Nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really re, it's really. I mean, the, the art is really cool and kind of uh, very hip. Nice. Uh, the gameplay is 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 fun and and. Uh, and yeah, it's, this is definitely one that's that's a quick and fun diversion and just good to have. Nice uh, to load up when cat, you need to kill some time. And that's but cat it, it, ball it's a, eats it's, it all. Yeah. <laughs> nice cat and, ball eats it all. Cat ball eats it all. I love the. <laughs> it title. looks lovely. I'm just, looking just, at it just, right now. Just just image image shirts and you you will fall in love with Mr. Catball. <laughs> <laughs> Try it out, Craig. Why don't you play while we're doing the next one here? <laughs> I can't. All right. I do not have an iPhone. Well, so it's not on Android, right? No, that's true. Is, I don't think is, so. It is not. Now, for those of you who are fans of Pitch Car, uh, Pitch Car is that game that it's kind of expensive. It's got the big wooden uh, track that you build, and then you flick little discs with little images of race cars on them around the track, and you're, it's just sort of a dexterity game. Well, if you like that game, you will like Disc Driven. So D I S C. And then space drive in with a little apostrophe after the end. And disk drive in is basically pitch car for your phone. Um, so basically, you flick on the screen with your finger, and the direction and, and force of the flick actually moves the disk down the track. And it's got all these crazy shaped tracks, and there's jumping and there's power ups. But basically, it's pitch car on your phone, and it has multiplayer over the internet support. So you can actually hook up with a friend and play in real time and try to bend them off the track and all that kind of fun stuff. So if you are a pitch car fan, definitely check out. And this is driving. on iPhone also. Only? It might it might also be on i on Android. I've never checked, but it might be. It's been better on a while, so it might be on both or something like it might be on both. Mm. All so right. check that out. So Eric, what about uh, you? Got any other ones? What else you been playing? Um. Well, I I also mentioned this one earlier. Is uh, in an oldie oldie but goodie is uh, uh, Kingdom of Loathing. 
Ooh. And if you've never tried it, it's been around for 10 years. And, and so shame on you for not trying it. But this is not on your phone. Right. This is a PC. This is, this is on in your, in, in your browser window. Oh, nice. So you, I, I guess theoretically, I haven't tried. I bet you could. I bet if you have a good browser on your phone, you could you could use it. I haven't now tried is it, that. Is it Flash? Now have you? Tr- um, now, I've never played it before. What, so what's it like? It's it's it's. I'm. You know, I don't know the technology. I should call those guys. <laughs> I ran into it at Comic Con and chatted with them a little bit. But I think it's just all PHP stuff. Okay. Databases and and but but I mean it's really interactive and it's a it's it's a role playing game, but it's all stick figures. Um, yeah. But it's really cleverly done stick figures, um, as cleverly done stick figures as you could possibly imagine, um, and it's and it's a really quite engaging little uh, role playing game where you where you run around and you increase your moxie and you collect meat and you try and be really cool while you're doing it, um, and and yeah, and it's you know it has full PvP, it has full nice, it has guilds, it has it has. Uh, <laughs> trading it has a you know has everything you might expect from a massively multiplayer role-playing game in stick figure um <laughs> nice. yeah i mean it, so i mean it's like you start playing this game and you're like i don't quite know what's going on here um and then the more you play you're like wow there's there's 10 years of depth here nice um that, that uh that and and you know and the graphics are like I said, they're stick figures, but it's really kind of made up for in just the, just the sheer amount of cleverness that the, that these creators have put into it um, <laughs> and developed over the years. Because um, yeah, if, if you if you don't enjoy the fact that you you know you're like one of the classes is a, a, a turtle, what, a, man, a turtle tamer and a, a <laughs> seal clubber and a, a pasta mancer. <laughs> wow. So. Um, yeah, so so they're they're atypical things that you're not going to necessarily uh, see in other other role playing games, um, but yeah, so so that that's another one where I said, okay, guys, you go learn this and play it because um, I need a guild. <laughs> yes, that's abusing power, I know, but but you know what you going to do? Nice. So when we see a a, a pasta mancer master come out from Alpha, we'll know where you got inspired <laughs> for that one. Exactly. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds awesome. Uh, what was the name of that one again? Kingdom, uh, Kingdom of Loathing. Loathing. Kingdom of Loathing. And, I'll check that out. And actually, spe- and speaking of Kingdom of Loathing, I, they actually just put up a uh, Kickstarter for a Kingdom of Loathing card game. We get all. I, I, I have no idea. So, so what it is? I just yeah. saw it come, pop up two days ago or something like that. But it looks pretty clever. Same sort of art. Um, and if it has anything as clever as the, as the PC game, it's uh, might be one to check out. Nice. I'll have to check that out. I, I, I like those kind of old school RPGs. I don't play one. Of those. <laughs> yeah. What are you looking at? I'm looking at the store at Kingdom of Loathing because it's free. Right. And so they ask for donations or buy stuff from their store. And there's all kinds of funny stuff. But there's there's a bumper sticker that says, I, and then the club sign from a deck of cards, seals. <laughs> yeah. So instead of I heart seals, it's yeah. I club seals. <laughs> that is, in fact, one of the classes. So, yes. Nice. So clever. My other car is made of meat. Yep. <laughs> I stole your accordion and knob goblins fear my moxie. Oh, uh, yes. One of, one of the classes is, in fact, an accordion thief. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's pretty I'm, funny. I'm liking it. I'll have to check that out. I, I like it. So. it yeah, it's, it's, it's clever in a way that, that can uh, exist for 10 plus years in, in, a, in, in that form. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So let's see. Oh, oh, so Craig, you mentioned Temple Run. I did. Which Temple Run spawned a bunch of games like it. And one of the games it spawned is actually called One Epic Night. However, uh-huh. Night is spelled K N I G H T. Yeah. Right? And this game is sort of right behind your 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 little knight. And what makes this game fun and charming is the is the voice acting and just the art style and, and the attention to detail in this game. But basically the game opens and there's this knight three-dimensionally modeled, pretty cute-looking little graphics knight standing there in front of a giant dungeon door. And he mm-hmm. taps the door, and the knight just starts running into the dungeon. And he always has a quippy little one-liner. He, he yells off on the way mm-hmm. in, like, oh, another day, another dungeon, and me running through a dungeon another day in the dungeon, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> just going on. And he goes running, I could walk, but why bother, you know, kind of thing. So he's running in the dungeon. And as you're running through the dungeon, instead of tilting your iPhone or iPad, you just swipe. So there's basically three lanes in the in the in the corridor, and you can kind of put them on the left side of the corridor, the middle, the right, or you can swipe up and it'll hop over something, you can swipe down and slide under something. Um, 
And as you go along, first you're just turning in the corridors. Then there's little piles of gold you're trying to grab as you go along. Then all of a sudden, you know, there's one of those swinging blades. You got to get to the side and slide <laughs> under it. And then all of a sudden, there's an orc. And if you didn't pick up a sword, you got to dodge him. But if you have a sword, you'll chop the orc in half, which doubles your points as you go down. And and it's just really clever, very fast, easy to play, extremely addictive because as you collect this money, you can then upgrade things. So you, the swords you find get better if you've upgraded your swords. You can find. There's mana you can collect, which gives you this little power to run super fast. You'll eventually find the dungeon gets more interesting as you go down. So the farther you get into the dungeon, all of a sudden the walls are getting darker. There's lava and there's <laughs> the monsters get more interesting. And there's gelatinous cubes you get stuck in. And uh, it's just really neat. And it's still a, it's still basically that over-the-shoulder temple run game. But the theme and the execution is just really, really well done. And that's um, One Epic Night. And it's also that kind of game where it's free, but then... Um, and this is very common now, the microtransaction <laughs> games. It's, it's free, but you get upgrades uh, uh, for you can either earn them in the game or you can pay money to get them quickly. Right? Mm-hmm. They, they 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 allure you into the fact that you can in fact spend seven thousand dollars on this game. <laughs> yes, in a very short order. Yeah, um, and and very logically, you know, they they appeal to your logical side. You're like, well, you know, I could spend hours on this game, but you know what? For just a hundred dollars, <laughs> I could only spend minutes to get to the same place. <laughs> right. That's satisfying in some way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's really funny. The, the, the writing's really, really well done. Um, and if you like the kind of thing, you definitely check it out. One Epic Night's a lot, a lot of fun. And we got a, a bunch of us addicted here. And it's also got that, that the other addictive part of it. Um, it's single player, but it's all through Game Center. So you can immediately keep your scores and, and compare your scores to your other friends. And it shows you on the screen how you're doing against them. Um, so it's really pretty funny. And, and uh, that's, that's another one that is uh, all iPad, iPhone. iOS iPhone and iPad, S. yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, how about, uh, Eric, you got another one for us? Um, there was one I was playing a while ago, and I'm not actually sure it's even around anymore. It's called Great Little War Game. Oh, yeah, it's still around. That's a good one. I played that one. Yeah, that's, that was a fun one that, that uh, you know, you just boot it up, and you, you kill some things for a while, and you then you're done. But, um, yeah, that's that's been one that's sort of constant rotation on my phone for almost, what, a year and a half now since it came out. Yeah, that's the hex-based little army one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you move. You have like you might have a tank and a guy and a and, and a sniper and a rifleman and that kind of thing. Yeah. That's, and I'd like to call it, in fact, a great little war game. It is a great little war <laughs> game. Yeah. In fact, yeah. they just came out with a great little war game too, and they've got like new units and everything. It just came out. Oh, really? Yeah. It's pretty cool. Check that out. You just killed my productivity. There you go. <laughs> like, oh, it's really good. Um, yeah, it's really fun. And, this, I mean, and that one is available yes. for the uh, Android. That's a, you'll like that one, Craig. That's a good one. Yeah. It looks cool. Um, I think that one costs money though. I think you got to spend ninety nine cents. Yeah, ninety nine cents. Yeah. You know, a whopping ninety nine dollars. Yep. Yeah, I know. Less than the price of a cheeseburger. You can game for hours. Well, that depends on what day you're going. Yeah, for I guess cheeseburger. You're right. <laughs> you go on the right day, you can you get, get two burger. for that money. <laughs> uh, let's that see. So pennies. Um, oh, I have another one. This one, Eric. I can destroy your entire office's productivity with this one. Have you played Outwitters yet? Uh, wait, what is it? What was that? Outwitters. Out Twitter, out, no. Outwitters, like outwit, but outwitters with an oh, S. Oh, okay. I was I was thinking it was a like tweet a lot. All right, so <laughs> out outwitters is brilliant because of how fast it is, which is what makes it so insidious. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no AI for this game. Uh, there might be no. Oh, there is actually. Yeah, but you don't care about the AI. You're going to play. It's basically a little tiny hex game, um, and I think this will appeal to your art side, Eric. The art is very very well done. And each of the forces, so it's basically factions on factions. There are three mm-hmm. different factions. They're all hyper cutesy. So there's like a little cutesy, like candy faction. There's one that's robots and there's one that's another one, but they're all really like cute little unicorn type things. Um, basically you got four unit types um, and you get a certain number of points for movement, but those, the, the action points you get per turn can also be used to spawn new guys. So do you decide, mm-hmm. do I spawn an, another guy or do I spend those points to move more guys? Um, it's very, very fast because the goal is to destroy the other guy's base. So basically, if you're not careful, it'll wipe your base out instantly. Um, two players, so you'll do a turn. It's one of those asynchronous games, so you'll move your turn, and then your fellow employee can move their turn, and it comes back to you and just, and just you know, dings in your phone, says your turn again, and you go back and forth and just kick, kick each other uh, around, the, around the home of that. It's a great game. What's also nice about it, though, is unlike a lot of those other games, um, this one you can play two on two if you want to. So you can team up and get oh, two neat. on two, which is neat too. What was, so. what was it, what was it, say it again. Outwitters. O U T W I T T E R S. Outwitters. Okay. I got to check that out because there's some way to crush the morale of my coworkers. Oh, yes. <laughs> exactly. That's that's really what I'm looking for. That is a morale crusher. Exactly. And you can team up too. So, like, you know, you can, you know, let's say you got the, the, the best employee of the month. Maybe he teams up with you and beats everybody else up, you know, kind of thing. Oh, good idea. Good, good fun. 
<laughs> and again, only available on iTunes. Sorry, Craig. Russ, you are useless to me. <laughs> so, how about you, Eric? You got another one for us, Eric? Um, I'm actually poking away at my phone now to see if there's anything hidden in there. A hidden gem? <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I had this one called Anomaly Warzone Earth. Ooh, I haven't tried that it's one. It's actually on my on my phone. I didn't play it that much, but it really actually was inspiring for a while because it's it's you know you know there's a bajillion games which are um, which are tower defense, right? Right. So right. You, you know you're 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 a tower, and your guys come. You know you put mm. put up your towers, and you kill the guys quicker. And right. this this one's a tower offense. So you got your little squad, and you have to like take out towers as as they're trying to kill you as you make your way around the map. Oh, to, that's a neat twist. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of a neat twist. It's actually a remarkably highly produced. So there's a lot of uh, um, it's just pretty. It's like it's almost it almost looks like something you you find on a PC. Yeah. Um, nice. Um, yeah, and then there's one more which I found here, which is Errol Wars Two, Ooh, which is one? actually, which is actually kind of a tower defense slash offense game. Um, you get your little guys. Uh, they there's two paths, and they're running at each other. And there's some there's another person at the other end. They're sending little guys down their path. So it's choosing which path you put your things on. And again, it's mm-hmm. choosing whether to to move guys along or build new guys to do it. To, to 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 take over one path or the other, and then eventually get to the other side and, and defend yourself while crushing someone else. Nice. Um, so that's another that's another one that's been uh, you know pretty much that's actually been the one when I'm not playing Blood Brothers and crushing people there. Um, mm-hmm. That's sort of been taking up my my not my own iPhone, my Androiding time. Nice. Uh, um, and that those, both both of those are Android games. There you go, Craig. Two Android. Nice. Uh, well, no, Eric's been a big help. <laughs> Unlike have other a, people, I don't have an Android. Yeah. Um, well, here you go. I will venture off the path and head over to the PC side. Now, I have to mention this game. This game just came out, and it was the result of a Kickstarter. Um, it's by an indie developer. It's available on Steam. It is very low overhead. It's actually 8-bit style graphics. It's called FTL. And it stands for, I believe, they don't tell you, but I think it stands for Faster Than Light. It's basically... so. At Gen Con, we were all excited about Artemis, which was the Starship Commander game, right? You take a call of the bridge. Well, FTL is basically a Starship commanding game. And what's brilliant about this game is um, how evil it is, how simple it is, but how much depth there is to it. So basically, you've got your sort of 8-bit drawn. Imagine a Starship from the top view, and imagine it was all sectioned out where you could see all the rooms. So you could see the bridge, you could see engineering. You can see the weapons control. You a couple extra rooms that don't matter, but they're there. Empty rooms. You got, you know, you got a, um, a life it's support. It's actually right in the title, FTL Faster Than there Light. There you go. See? So I, <laughs> I thought I was being all crafty and deriving it, but it's right there for me. I just yeah, subconsciously it's right read there. it. It's actually the title of the game is so FTL Faster Than Light. So there's all these little views, and then your guys are all like little 8-bit guys, and, and you'll have like a captain. You'll, you start with like three humans commanding your ship, okay? And as you're playing the game, basically the ship will just jump from sector to sector. When you get into a sector... Um, you know, something will happen. Typically, it could say something like, "There's a space in, a space station invaded with spiders. What do you invested with spiders? What do you do?" And you can you can send your crew over to try to save the space station. And there's a ba- background die roll happens. And sometimes you get something, and sometimes they die. But what's more interesting is when you get to a section, it'll say there's an enemy ship there, and you can fight them. When you fight them, you can use there's power meters and everything else. You can transfer your power to your different systems. You can decide I'm going to power up my engines and lower my shields, or raise my shields and lower my weapons. And if you beat the ship, you'll get. Um, loot from them, and you can basically spend that on upgrading your ship. And you can upgrade all these different systems. You can make your weapons better. You get really interesting weapons. You can make your um, little things, too, like upgrading your doors in your ship. You actually manually open and close the doors. So if your ship catches on fire, a little fire starts spreading, you can actually try to seal your crew off into a section and then open the airlock doors and try to vent the fire into space and little tricks like that you can pull off. But then what will happen is you got that open, you're trying to vent the sp- fire and your O2 levels are dropping. The bad guys will shoot your door controls and knock your door controls out so you can't close your doors. You're like, oh God! So you're running around. Then someone will beam onto your ship and you're like, I got intruders in deck three. So you're trying to send your guys to the intruders, but you've opened the doors. You can't go through the open. So like guys are dying and it's just really crazy hectic. And what's really evil about it is it has um, permadeath, which is basically... For old school gamers, it used to be that your games all you always died, right? Back in the days of the arcades, you played, you dead, you lost, you, you started over. Well, 
many these, these younger gamers don't know how easy they have it. Now everybody's used to save points, right? This game's got no save points. You basically play, and when your ship is destroyed, you're done. Now you can, in the middle of your adventure, if you decide you have to go away, you can click save and leave, but you come back, you're right where you left off, and anything bad happens to you, it's permanent. You can't undo it. <laughs> so it's really a very quick game. You die often, you go back again, but you, but you learn. You're like, oh, one more time, I'll try it again, and you unlock different ships and different options, different crew, and there's different factions you can get. There's Some guys repair better, some guys are better fighters. There's the rock race, which is a unifier, and they stomp it out really well. It's just a fun little game. It's like eight bucks on the PC, really cheap. It's on Steam. Ten. Um, well, it was, oh, it was eight because it when it was launch weekend, it was on sale. Um, yeah. Great little game. Definitely worth checking out. Very simple to play. Don't need to be a big video game guy. It's not a Twitch game. It's just you click on the guys, move around. Um, you don't need to be a super cool first person shooter. What's a Twitch it. game? Well, Twitch games are like you know, like uh, Halo or something. Where you got to really move quick and move your move your thumbs quick to, to shoot. You know, this is just oh. a click to go. It's not like you, well, um, yeah, you got to react. And, and, yeah. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. So I really so, like it. FTL. So I was I was so quick question for you guys since you brought up an eight bit game. Yeah. What do you guys think of all these eight bit games and eight bit graphics sort of dominating the world at the moment in terms of gaming? Because they're everywhere. They are everywhere. Um. I have mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, I really like the artsy games. Like I really like to see really great art and background and looking around um, and just seeing like, you know, playing a game like Mass Effect or or even even the really cool art style like Borderlands 2 or everything sort of that hyper colorful cartoon style. Um, but at the same time, what this is allowing is people who it's a much smaller development team, you know, and they can really do some very I mean, look at Minecraft. There's a yeah. great example of a really brilliant game concept that was executed by like one guy because, you know, he, he didn't have to be a really great artist. I mean, he's a good 8 bit artist, but you don't have to have like, you know, the ability to draw a perfectly good face and everything. So I, I think that kind of stuff and, and FTL is another great example of a fun, addictive game um, where you don't need to have that skill set. And, and I guess it's retro, but also people like Minecraft's a huge hit, even with people who never played it, but games oh, before. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. What do you think, Eric? You should have seen it. Yes. Yeah. Well, you should have walked around Comic Con. There's there was so many square heads. In the oh, I know, right? <laughs> Can't get through the hall. Is that what those are from? That's from Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and the the pick too, right? Yep, you dig the, the, Yeah, the picks everywhere. Yep. Yeah, they My, were all they yeah, were everywhere I, at Gen Con I, too. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So I'm I'm really I'm I'm similarly torn, and and to some degree, being a game designer. It, it's it's a little frustrating because I'm like <laughs> I, I've done all these games with lots of color and, and <laughs> right. like I you know I don't even want to know how much I've paid artists over the years. I'm like, do you think they'd let me get away with <laughs> with eight bit? Um, I don't know if an eight bit miniatures game would work. <laughs> what are you talking about? Everyone like look at Lego. Well, good I mean, point. Lego yeah, is good basically point. Basically, the eight bit of miniature games. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're totally right. I stand and I, I actually, actually, I have a secret love affair with 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 Lego games. Oh, I've told Nathan over and over again. If Lego calls me up and offers me a job, I'm gone. <laughs> you're out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, well, then you would see me doing miniature games for Legos for, for the rest of my life. Hey, I'm ready um, for the Lego weird line. Where's Where's the Lego Malifaux models? I want to see it. I, yeah, we that should, would be we should, awesome. We should make that up. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm very similarly torn because I love beautiful like to look at pretty things and mm-hmm. it and yeah i i don't know i but there is something very sort of like primal about how it takes you back to the to how you used to game yeah as well um and so many of those games were good in a way that you you can't kind of recreate that now good good in a way like you'd never played it before so you remember right. like like um discovering gaming Mm-hmm. And, and and things like that. So so yeah, I'm and I'm likewise torn. Um it, and I just wonder where it's gonna go. It is interesting because I, I, I thought for a while that it was just nostalgia. You know, now that all of us old gamers are 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 have have had that, that they could make this nostalgia stuff, but like my daughters are the same way. They absolutely love Minecraft. And yet also their other big favorite game is Skyrim. And that's interesting because Skyrim is is very much a sandbox game too, like like Minecraft. In fact, they just released a new expansion where you can you know, build. You can actually buy land and build your house the way you want it, and and find the right materials. It's sort of like Minecraft, but they like both equally. Even though, you know, they didn't grow up on epic games, but and they love the you know in Skyrim you can see the wind blowing and the snow blowing over the mountains right. and the dragons look awesome. And um and yet at the same time, you know, they like Minecraft too. And I think it's just a different. It's almost like the difference between a book and a movie. 
they're both awesome and they're both you use your imagination just in different ways i kind of wonder if it's not like that but you it really comes down to great game mechanics and, and working together with the medium right so i don't know yeah and, and, and i've actually thought about that i've actually thought about that too it's almost it's almost like um you know you saw those like final fantasy 37s and things like that right and and it was so many cinegraphic cut scenes and you know like there was you could sit down and watch the game right and there's there actually all, youtube things where you just watch the game it was almost more movie uh, than game in those and it was movies. like uh-huh. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah there was like seven hours you could right. sit down for a day and just watch the plot unfold of this game so and but but it yeah, it was the same thing they were so dependent and so focused around this that it's like well what does the gameplay even matter right um huh. So it's so so it's so out of you know in the, in the periphery. Whereas you know it sort of almost makes you feel like if you're doing this, you need to do a good game um, because yeah. you're not you're not uh, covering it with with those cutscenes. Seven hours of cinematic cutscenes. Yeah, and they, and they have them on the iPhone too. It's funny because like if you look at games like Tiny Tower, I mean that's a huge successful game, and that's mm-hmm. totally eight bit. And the other one, uh, the plane one, uh, I forget the name of it now. Pocket Planes, another great example. Again, it's gameplay first, mm-hmm. but they do it in a way. I mean, there's definitely an art style eight bit that can look cool and capture. I think it's just hard about it because it's like very, very simple lines, but you know what you're looking at immediately, uh, which I think is 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 harder than it probably looks. I'm right. sure I you would, know. Yeah, yeah, I would say there's a there there's a. I mean, that calls for a talent all its own, sort of right. to make it less like a it's chunky eight bit and more of a like you're saying, Russ, that you look at it, you know. I mean, you know, you can do a minimalist design and still have it look really cool. Right. Yeah. And actually I just, we, we were talking about one this morning that was up on Kickstarter now and I just found it. It's called sea lark. Yeah. And it's just one guy, um, from Ohio who, um, it's just a really, it's a neat looking game. It's a great backstory about a guy who is literally unemployed and now is making a beautiful looking, game because and it's in it it's eight bit and he can do it because it's eight bit right um but yeah i mean check that out it's it's one that caught my attention this, I'll this check it morning out. actually see sea lark uh-huh. i'm I'll looking at it he's uh already way over his goal so good he is him. already he, he does not need your help but <laughs> no um but you might, you might want to jump in on it so you can take part <laughs> you right. just may right uh well that's a good segue speaking of the two um I wanted to mention a couple games that are not out yet, oh, but coming oh, soon. All of his special stuff's already sold out. <laughs> nice. That's good these two. Too awesome. late. Yeah. And 8 Bit's definitely making a resurgence, and so are classic games. And I think that's what's interesting, because um, what people are finding is they want to bring back these classic games specifically on mobile platforms, because everybody's excited about seeing the old games come back. And mm-hmm. one of the big ones coming out this fall is Baldur's Gate. Eric, did you ever play ah. Baldur's Gate, the original? Oh, yeah. So Baldur's Gate, what they're calling the enhanced version, is coming out for iOS and iPad as well as um, PC on, I think, Steam this fall. And that's a fantastic way to spend some time while you're on the – you got a long plane flight. You know what? I hope it comes out in time for my trip to Hawaii. I want to sit in there and just play Baldur's Gate all the way (laughs) over there. Um, That's a fantastic one, though, and that's a great – you know, those kind of games, you you save them, you just come back and jump right into them again. And you think about it now, they're they're so – they were – what they run on when it was first written in the late nineties, of course your phone is probably tw- you know, four times more powerful than a PC back then. So it's probably easy to do just get the touch interface worked out. Um, and update the graphics a little bit, but I think it's great to see some of these classic games making a comeback and, um, and being on these devices. So I definitely want to check out Baldur's Gate when it comes out this fall. Yeah. I think, I think, I think actually the first game I ever loaded onto my, onto a phone was a uh, final fantasy one. There you go. Bring Which it back. I adore. Yeah, yeah, it's what's fun to get the old games back, and it's it's kind of crazy to think about you're playing it on a phone when you first played it was on like a giant, you know, huge expensive PC. Yeah. Um, now the other one coming out, this isn't really retro, but it kind of is. Um, Mech Warriors. I don't know if you're a BattleTech fan, Eric, at all, but um, Mech Warriors making a comeback. I, did you ever play BattleTech? I did. You did. Were you a fan? Did you did you own your? What was your favorite mech? Um, you know, it's been a long time. I forget the damn names. Oh. Uh, I, yeah. <sighs> All right. Well, Randall, Randall will be in touch. I don't remember. <laughs> um, well, I love Battletech too, and I, and I had a lot of different mechs. And the, um, what's neat is Mech Warrior Online is coming out for the PC, and that is a massively multiplayer, you're in a mech simulator, right? But um, that's going to be cool. But I'm actually more interested in Mech Warrior Tactics and Mech Warrior Tactical Command. So MechWarrior Tactics is a PC hex-based Battletech game. Um, 
And then tactical command is the same idea, but on your phone. And that would be fantastic. I think playing a little, um, te- you know, basically playing Battletech on your phone would be awesome. Um, and they're going to have the great graphics, and you see the little missiles arc and the whole business and his line of sight and elevation and trees in the way. And that's, that's, um, that's going to be a lot of fun, too. So I'm looking, I'm really much looking forward to that coming out also and, and seeing all that craziness on my, on my well, phone. Well, it's just, I mean, if you look at phone games, there's so many, there's so many. There's just a hole there. It's like, yeah. where is the game? Where's the games for intelligent gamers on your phone? Right. Um, because it seems like every, every, all the game designers are like, well, the, everyone has a phone, so let's try and develop a game for everyone. Right. And that's that's just sort of the pervasive, you know, it's like how many Farmville clones can you put on your phone? Right, which is totally a time. Um, so yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. it's nice to see so the new ones. That's my frustration at the moment. Yeah, well, hopefully some good ones are coming out. A little, little Baldur's Gate, a little Mech Warrior, a little, you know, other stuff coming out soon. Hopefully some good... Good hotness, and there's all those gaming aids we too we talked about before to help you play your, your main games. But it's nice to have these little diversions. Um, so, do we miss any, Eric? You playing any other? If you want, go ahead. Well, there's there's one actually. Since you brought up Baldur's Gate, I immediately thought of another Kickstarter. Did, can, can you tell I spend way too much time on this site? <laughs> um, <laughs> from the from Obsidian Entertainment Project Eternity, which is up there, and it looks like an amazing throwback, um, but with modern technology sort of game. So. That's when I'm excited to see where it comes oh, from because yeah. I think, like everyone, Baldur's Gate is one of the the classic best. Yeah, they already um, made their goal. Their goal was 1.1 million, Craig, and they're already at 1.8 million. Yeah, so they, they, uh, yes, they I'm they, seeing that. So they got their they goal. They also don't need us, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are the guys that did some of those games, right? These are yeah. this is the original designers of Baldur's Gate and some other great games, Icewind Dale, Planetscape. These guys are all coming together and making their own brand new RPG, and so that's a no brainer. I yeah, think they so, hit their goal yeah. like day one, right? Didn't they? It was some crazy thing. It, ac- it actually takes a little bit of time to build $1.1 million. I think it was day two. <laughs> right, right. So we'll be watching for the for the weird miniature $1.1 million one, Eric. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, PC games still have the bigger market share, but you'll get there. You'll get there, guys. I'm, I'm sure. One of coming. these days. One of these days, yeah. Right. So any other great games you're playing, Eric, right now, or is that pretty um, much the digital? I, I think I just went through them all. Yeah, that's, good. That's the, those are the ones that are coming up. Well, great. Well, Craig, do you have any other contributions you want to add to the? To no, the I got here? nothing. <laughs> nothing. <okay. laughs> I think I'm going to check out Great Little War Game, though. There you go. I think you should. You'll I think enjoy that's going to be what I check out. You'll enjoy it. Okay, I'm glad you got one out of there. Yeah, Hopefully, you, our you. listeners got some good ideas for your gaming habits between uh, between bus rides and waiting for the table at dinner or whatever. Um, that, that's a sociable way to. <laughs> hey, honey, let's go to dinner so I can play a game on my phone. Right, exactly. Well, we play actually for those moments. I actually play uh, Zuluretto and stuff, and you put the pass and play games. You pass them around. Uh-huh. Together. Yes, indeed. See? Keeps the kids happy, and they're not sticking to your favorite painted model inside a glass of water, which is always trouble. <laughs> so, uh, wow, little dig <laughs> right there. <laughs> I need- I need to figure out the best time to actually because right now my my two year old she picks up my phone. And I don't know how she does it, but in about 30 seconds, it races half, half the icons on my phone. Nice. And I mean, I can't do that, but she, <laughs> she does. So I don't think, don't think she's to, to the pass and play game yet. Nice. Well, she'll get there. Uh, she would reprogram things. She'll get there. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We yeah, really Eric, appreciate it. It's been great having yeah. you on. And yeah, glad, always glad to be here. Well, thanks so much. And best of luck to you and your, you and all the folks at Weird with all your new hey, projects. Is, there, is there anything new coming down the pipe that you can give our listeners a little hint of what the, what Weird's got coming? Um, I don't know if you've seen it on our website, but we are going to do a Malifo RPG Kickstarter. Oh, yes. I'm very ah, excited about see, that. There you go. Yes. Yeah, I know. And, and we actually have a logo design contest going on. And we have like what you might want to see in the Kickstarter and – like we're really trying to get people involved in it and and make it feel like a community sort of deal um, because it's, you know I think it's it's been one of those things that we've had so much demand for I don't know two years that uh, we're sort of like well I guess if we get around to doing it now we probably better actually try and get people as involved as possible because I think it's a lot of people have thought a lot about it and and done their own sort of versions of it and one thing or another so we're trying to uh, talk and hear from all you guys um, about nice. what to do so that's the, I mean that's sort of the big uh, immediate thing coming up but yeah i mean like i said we have some uh, you know like uh, evil baby expansions nice uh, yeah you could you get to have time nannies um and actually have time nanny cards oh so the different they have different specs like you have different yeah so, oh, so nice. you get you could you could um you play the game but you might have a different little superpower nice um, <laughs> it helps you deal with with babies in it and maybe a special win condition where you're like i want seven bitey babies which is going to be hard to do but <laughs> Now, is but, there a variant? Uh, but would be. A, is is there a is there uh, a is there a Mary Poppins time nanny who's practically perfect in every way? I think you have to have one. 
Well, I mean, you you put me in an IP related situation. <laughs> ah, um, <right. laughs> um, but but if you if you and if and when people see the game, you will you will see that we t- we 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 dodge around IP <laughs> as good as we possibly can. Nice. So so I don't think we could avoid something that that might uh, in slight resemblance go nice. that way. But yeah, I mean, think about think about either the best time travelers or nannies right. in in your world and. They may, they may make a, make they a, may make an appearance. appearance. Awesome, that's gonna be fantastic. I can't wait to see that either. Super nanny. So, Eric, what's the what's the best website to go to to check out all the latest hotness from Weird and all that good stuff? Just weirdgames.net. Easy Pretty much remember. everything's there. Sweet. Awesome. That's weird with a Y. Don't forget. Yeah. All right. W Y R D. Thanks again, Eric. I really appreciate it. Take yeah. care and have Talk a great great day. Talk to you again soon. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Looking for not too horrible insight and entertainment beyond the usual paltry four hour D6G shows? Well, there's only one place on the planet you can find it, and it's in the lost chapters. Go to the d6generation.com and begin your quest. Damn, farming games. Why did it have to be farming games? Hey, and uh, well, summer's just wrapping up here, of course, and that's vacation time is 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 past for a bunch of us. But uh, you know what? Vacations are for year round. All sure. you have to do is talk to the Wakelands about their plans for October to, to know to know that. Right, we're going to Hawaii. Unfortunately, you know it's not in Hawaii right now. There what is, is no Geek Nation tour in Hawaii. That's which is true. which is sad because Geek Nation Tours has all kinds of great things and it would be awesome for me to go, you know what, I'm going to be in Hawaii anyway, Terrace. What crazy geeky things could I see in Hawaii? That's right. Because no. if you go to their website, geeknationtours.com, right. and go to upcoming tours, you'll see all of the crazy places. Mexican gaming holiday. They are actually Ooh. in the UK right now. Oh, I have to tell Nicole this. They're going to, I have to tell Nicole this. They're going to, they've got a Comic-Con tour that's very brand new, New York Comic-Con in oh, NYCC, October yeah. 11th through 14th this coming year. Uh, oh, that's right around the corner. It is. Nicole's planning on attending. She'll be there, so maybe you'll bump into her if you go on that tour. Absolutely. And uh, that's a fantastic con. It's it's uh, one of Nicole's favorites because it is all the comic hotness, but without all that schnooty thing going on in, Ho- in California with all the stars. It's much more <laughs> You like don't want to deal with fans. that schnooty. You don't want schnooty. That's no good. Schnooty um, is that'll not good. That would be fantastic. So that looks really cool. And of course, there's the Black Library Canadian Expo and Rocky Mountains Tour. How can yeah. that be bad? That, that can't be bad. And then that there's the Black bad. Library um, Artisan Tour, Black Library Weekend, and Black Library Literary Sites. Right. I mean, it's really, you cannot, it's, it's crazy how Geek Nation Tours has exploded over this past year of our first, uh, of our relationship because right. just looking at the list of things that you can do. And, the, and now it looks to me like tours are like overlapping. And right. I mean, so it's just, there, there's just so much geeky goodness out there all over the world. And Terrace and the guys at Geek Nation Tours, guys and gals at Geek Nation Tours, they're the ones that are going to bring you there. And you'll, the experience will just be phenomenal. With cool bowling shirts. With cool bowling shirts. So check out Geek, geeknationtours.com and click on Upcoming Tours for all the deets. This edition of Jever Notice is brought to you by Roos. The only way to escape a murder charge is to pin it on someone else first. Quick, what's your alibi? Roos, coming soon to kickstarter.com. Did you ever notice the power of the words thank you? Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but I think it also always bears mentioning again every now and then. And it always comes around early in the school year because I have to explain to my students the the importance and the value of uh, common courtesy in very stressful situations. For instance, in theater, where it's just a giant minefield of things waiting to go wrong, you're just waiting for the next person to drop a line or for a prop to be someplace it's not supposed to be or for a special effect to go off when it's not supposed to. And you're just, you've got a million things to worry about. And the last thing you want to do is add to that tension by running by somebody or picking something up that somebody else was looking at or using or 
And so what we drill into the students and what I had drilled into my head as an adult working in theater was the importance of please and thank you and how powerful those two terms can be, especially under stressful situations, but even just in everyday life. And so, for instance, when you're rushing by somebody, excuse me, thank you, that kind of thing, it goes a mile. And people notice, believe it or not, or maybe it's just me, but I definitely notice when people don't say please and thank you and excuse me and things like that. And it always comes back around to me when I'm, when I'm working with other people and there are people that are courteous and there are people that aren't. And now I have a whole new crop of students that I've had for about three weeks now. And you see the ones who say please and thank you. And, and there's, a, there's a way you, you can go over the top too. And anybody out there who's worked in theater, I have absolutely no doubt has run into those people too. That everything is please or thank you or I'm sorry. And at that point you're just like, oh, please just get it over with and do whatever you're going to do. But for the most part, um, you, you, it, it comes down to people who say please and thank you and appropriate and people who just take it for granted. And those people who take it for granted are not bad people. They're just either they're in a rush or they're just not quite thinking about, you know, the effect of what's going on around other people, especially under stressful situations, which is perfectly normal. But that, I believe, is the time when it's even more important to say please and thank you and excuse me and all those little things that your grandmother would want you to say if she was watching a closed circuit television of your entire life. And so... It's moments like this, it's times like this where I start to think, and, and I see it in gaming too, and I see it where a, a guy will walk by and he'll just pick up a model off the table painted by somebody else without asking for it. Or, uh, you know, uh, tight, confined space in the gaming store and people are trying to squeeze back and forth and somebody jostles you or just moves you out of the way, uh, you know, you know, bumps you out of the way or, or just stands there staring at you, waiting for you to move. And it just... It's it's gaming is supposed to be fun, much like theater. Theater is well, theater is a job, generally speaking. But if it wasn't fun, you wouldn't have all these kids doing it or wanting to do it. So even in those fun situations, you want to try to go the extra mile. You want to try to be aware of what's going on around you so you can say please and thank you and excuse me when it's appropriate. And and, and I think it's important. I think it sets the tone for mutual respect and appreciation of what everybody else is going through. And it goes beyond that a little bit. I mean, if people are really working hard to bring you some sort of event or something, make sure that you are, they, that they know that you appreciate it. Because if they don't think that you appreciate it, they're probably not going to do it as often. And, and really, it just takes a quick thank you, you know, or, or, or an act of, of appreciation, you know, like just, just you meet them halfway or something like that. It's just very important to say, you know, to get that out there. And um, in particular, I'm thinking right now I, I, I have something huge that's in the works right now, something that's really enormous, that's building up some steam and uh, a whole new thing I've never done before that I'm, I've been signed on to do. And I'm very excited and at the same time very nervous because like I said, I've never done this before. I think the potential is huge. I uh, can't say any more about it right now, but it's it's been really kind of drumming everything home to me because the people that I'm working with in this new endeavor are very, very hands-on and very, very appreciative of everything that, that I do and that we do. And that, I mean, the, it's, a, it's a work environment that is extremely supportive and congenial. And that goes a huge way. It reminds me of, of jobs in the past, not really current jobs, although, you know, you're working with people and they're really, really busy and they don't return phone, emails sometimes and stuff like that and totally legitimate. And it, but it, 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 get, it can get frustrating, but I mean, way before the podcast or anything, I, I can remember job sites and things that I've done where, you know, it's just expected that you're going to do your job. In theater in particular, one of the primary ways that you rehearse anything is you run through your play or a scene or whatever it is, and the director takes notes. And then afterwards, everybody sits around and he gives you these notes and explains how he wants you to do things better or theoretically how you did what well what what you did well if something went particularly good 
and and you've got that's not the right grammatical for structure, but oh well. Uh, you have um, you you've got two general types of directors. Also, the kind of directors that are very thankful and they let you know when you're doing well, and the kind of director that focuses on the negative stuff because they assume that you're going to do the correct stuff, and that makes total sense that you've been hired to do this or been cast, depending on what level, to do this. And so you're expected to have it. And they're going to talk to you about the stuff that they're not happy with. But I've always seen, and I've always seen when I'm doing it on my own, you get much better results when you let people know the stuff you like as well as the stuff that you don't like. And so it's just really important. That thank you, that appreciation is huge for spurring on the creative mind, for spurring on just about anything, really. And so I just wanted to come back around and 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 talk about that for a few minutes because I think, you know, every now and then it's really good to kind of remember the basics and remember to bring things back to those 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 foundational aspects of communication because that's what gaming is. We're constantly communicating and we're, whether it's email or it's across the tabletop or you're using Vassal or you're texting or you're online playing games in your little Turtle Bay whatever it is headset. It's 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 fun and it's fun to trash talk and everything else, but there's an element of it that should always be there that courteous uh, considerate element that I think is is key to any positive social interaction. And, and you know that there are people out there that aren't like that. And I and I know that none of them are listening to me right now because all of our listeners are awesome. But, you know, it's just something you should be aware of and spread the word out there. And uh, who knows? Maybe you can brighten somebody else's day or lower their stress level with just a simple please or a thank you. And that's really all I've got to talk about this week. So thanks for listening. And... Uh, Good night. Achievement unlocked. You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by either emailing us at info at the D6 generationcom or by posting in our official D6G episode thread at the top of the DACA discussions forum on DACADACA.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. See you in two weeks. Thanks for listening and happy gaming. The theme from Total Fangirl comes from the soundtrack of The Last Night on Earth, The Zombie Game, courtesy of Flying Frog Productions, and is a composition of Mary Beth Magalanes. They're two, they're four, they're six, they're eight. Oh, well. Pushing cars and hauling freight. See? Red and green and brown and blue, they're the very useful crew. Is that enough? Yeah, that reminds me, actually. I was at a, um, I went apple picking with a family, and someone was singing the, the Little Einsteins theme to their kid, and it got stuck in my head for a week. I couldn't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see? <laughs> I watch, uh, I watch Thomas, the, uh, Thomas and Friends, actually, for terrain ideas. Sure, it's nothing to do with your child at all, right? It's just No, 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 <laughs> I'm watching it with him, but I'm actually watching it like, oh, it'd be cool to I fight know. a battle over that. Terrain. Model railroading. Yeah, you exactly. Okay, Eric, can you give me some uh, little noise there? Hello. <laughs> See, Eric Is that looks, enough noise? That's great, but Eric will not <laughs> sing a child's there. theme song, even though we know he knows Barney by heart by now. Look, m- my <laughs> wife handed me the Wiggles the other day. She's like, play this in the car. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> have you dick- See, I have, I have had gone, my girls are older now, but I have gone to no less than four Wiggles concerts. Wow. Oh, wow. That is, yes, they keep coming to New Hampshire for some reason. Um, I, I, I will stop complaining right now. Yeah, then. exactly. So, you know, just saying.